really.
Jason. Okay. You guys ready? I'd like to call to order Tuesday, August 24th, 2021 work session for the Town Council of the Town of Breckenridge. It is 3 p.m. We begin with uh, Planning Commission decision. Before we jump into oh, the agenda. Oh, you, know, you just told me that too, and I totally- I know, you have a lot James, of things on you your mind. James, introduce our new- Assistant uh, Public Works Director. Our new public, Assistant Public Works Director. Where is he? Which is awesome. It's about to said Public Works, our new Public Works Director. But. Shows you how good my memory is, man. That thing just went. Yeah, good afternoon, just everyone. Like so, I just want to take an opportunity to introduce Kristen Bronson. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. We'll see you. As Rick said, new assistant public works director. Kristen comes, um, um, she's had spent the last 23 years of her career at the FAA doing, um, doing airport all things airports from all the way from Grand Junction all the way over to uh, Wow, very good. Right on. Very excited and um, thank you for welcoming her. So. Welcome to town. Thanks for being part of the part of the team. Yeah. Does she know what she's getting into? With you, you mean? Nobody ever does. They always they always brief the new staff on Jeff Bergeron. That's, that's part of the packet, actually. <laughs> All right, we have uh, planning commission decisions from August 17th, 2021. There's really only one big diggity. Anybody going to have a call up this evening? No? Yeah. All right. Hey, did we move um, the call up for the 14th? To the 14th for the uh, rooftop deck at RMU. All right. That's a nice addition to that building. That's going to look yeah. really good. Oh, this one at Chapalis. Yeah. No, that needed a update. So I'm glad he's doing it. <clears throat> All right. Maybe. Uh, legis <laughs> <laughs> legislative review. We have fine in lieu uh, amendment ordinance A1221. Tim? Uh, from time to time, the Liquor and Marijuana <laughs> Lic Licensing Authority holds hearings to impose sanctions on liquor licensees who have violated the law. The town code currently allows the liquor licensing authority at the request of a licensee to accept a fine in lieu of requiring the licensee who has violated the law to serve a period of suspension. This ordinance, if amended, would uh, change the parameters of the allowed fine to reflect a recent statutory amendment made by the Colorado legislature. The fine still has to be an estimate of 20% of the uh, liquor revenues that would have been earned during the period of suspension. But now the minimum is five, minimum fine is 500 and the maximum fine is 100,000. Don't know that we'll be doing many hundred thousand, but you never know. You never know. There are no changes to this <clears throat> ordinance from first reading. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and I would imagine there would be a warning first. No. Right? But well, no warning. It depends on the nature of the violation. Okay. okay. Violations, um, if they're severe enough, we'll go to a hearing okay. right away. But like, say, a busker who's new to town who doesn't know the rules because no, it's always it better not be selling liquor. <laughs> right. <laughs> we generally we. Oh my gosh, I'm on the wrong thing. I'm yeah, sorry. we're not finding a busker hundred grand. <laughs> This is liquor and marijuana. We already do. Uh, Save that question for the next one. Sorry. You know what? I, I respect that you admitted it because I would have totally faked it. <laughs> I thought she was going down that road too. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm looking ahead. No, you know the liquor and marijuana. Um, yeah, no, group, they totally, know what they're doing. So totally support I, it. I think it's great. Please ignore me. All right. Still don't know. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. This will be on for second reading this evening. We have first reading of a noise ordinance amendment. Noise in public spaces ordinance. My, as my memo explains, the town currently has an ordinance dealing with the uh, volume or the, the noise uh, that is allowed or really prohibited in a public place. Right now, it requires, among other things, somebody to complain that the noise is disturbing their peace and quiet. This ordinance, if adopted, would amend the ordinance to re remove the subjectivity issue of disturbance of um, my peace and quiet and simply uh, set a 25 foot uh, 25 foot limit on the noise. 
uh, the standard is plainly audible, uh, which it has been upheld. It's a little bit uh, vague, but to avoid that problem with that, I also included a definition in the ordinance of plainly audible. Thank you, Tim. Uh, anyone have questions? Aaron? Aaron? <laughs> yes, Aaron, I would expect the, uh, the uh, police department to warn first. Oh, certainly before they gave a $100,000 fine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to put that out there because like th this, this might be an attempt to deal with where we're having people that are plugging in and uh, yeah. having amplified music. Um, the one area that certainly we could adjust this before second reading, I mean, 25 feet basically makes almost everything right. I mean, even yeah. normal conversation, there are we've seen them as low as 25 feet but we've also seen it would be realistic to do 50 feet which gives just a little more distance and and if it's really if you're really going for amplified music 50 feet is gonna get that but it would allow <coughs> some other conversations to happen that might not be you know as audible but so 25 feet is not i mean that's you know less than him and i right here so and when the NRO does their little like pop up concerts or whatever, yeah, those do are they permitted. always have a permit for that, or is would that fall under something like this? Well, if it's a permitted activity, it would be exempt from this. Right, but I, do we know if they if there's ever like you know when you have a random violinist Most of those from the aren't NRO? Fifty people or more, so they're not going to end up with a specially done permit. Right, exactly. So I, I would be supportive of of a fifty foot. I, I would be supportive of changing this to 50 foot because like those little like where it's just two or three of the NRO musicians. They're, they're not amplified though. Right, but this, does it have to be amplified? No, it doesn't have to be amplified. See, that's, that's the thing. And so, but I don't think you'll be able to hear them. Yeah. My problem with 50 feet is if that's you get, whole river if you get three people, you'll get, I mean, if you're in the middle of that 50 foot radius, you'll be able to hear all three of them, which is really the impetus for this is so that we don't get dueling speakers in the river walk. I would rather river encourage, frogs, I should say. I'm sorry. Yeah. I would just rather encourage NRO to get some sort of, you know, to let us know that they're gonna have these concerts and we could issue something. Okay. Some of those oboe players really rock out. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I think this, Ordinance is great, but I'm wondering, it's very specific to public spaces, which I know is what we're trying to address with Blue River Plaza, town-owned property, recreational activities. Um, because we're considering this, I'm just thinking, are there other areas of our noise ordinance that would be worth tightening up? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, the noise ordinance, I mean, this is only one component of it. Uh -huh. The other, the main, part of the noise ordinance has to do with the decibel limit in certain areas yeah, in the yeah, town especially when it's emanating from private property yeah and i think if you were to i don't know how you would do it where you couldn't have if you just had audible noise you know a similar standard coming from private property would be that that'd be a nightmare yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah but didn't we just kind of make a pass an ordinance of, or may, agreed that we can kind of leave it up to the discretion of the the cops when they show up, rather than as far as what is intrusive in a, in a neighborhood. Well, it, it, yes, it always is their discretion on this, but it also gives them a tool, a tool to use when we have problems. So, like we could get people complaining about somebody in the plaza, you know, with which we've had recently plugged into an amplifier playing music that but nobody really wants to go to court over it. They don't want to call in and be a complaint right, right, and right. say it's disturbing my peace. So but if they call in and say, Look, can't you just make this person stop? Now they have a tool to allow them to say you got to stop, or we're gonna have to cite you. But in the in a neighborhood, we have we have a recourse where uh, the the police can kind of make a judgment call if this is excessively loud music or, or loud noise. Well, you yeah, I mean you have you have the uh, decibel reading. That's yeah, yeah, right. But I I would think that even with potential noise violation, 
not this one, but the general decibel limits, the officer would typically ask him to tone it down. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Altaverde 2, Development Management Agreement. This is a resolution. Hi, Lori. Hello. Hi, Lori. Yeah, it is. I think um, Kimball is um, attending as a um, Zoomer attendee, but not Zoomy. a participant. And Helen was going to add her if we need her. Um, See. Does she want to talk or just be? Um, I, unless you have questions, but she's just out there right now. Um, so this is a resolution to approve a development agreement for the second phase of Alta Verde, and my memo spells out sort of what that project is and what the development um, agreement um, says in terms of whose responsibilities are are to do what. But basically, 150 to 200 apartments be a combination of one, two, and three bedroom units. They'll be deed restricted to local employees, so no remote. Uh, we have some rent caps on 90% uh, of the units and 10% of the units won't have a rent cap. Those will be available for sort of um, master leases for upper blue employers. 50% um, of the units will also be income cap. And um, this deed restriction will survive foreclosure, which is always important to us. The town will need to loan about $6 million to the project, um, plus an additional maybe $2 million if we uh, need that for net zero. Town will also cover water caps and provide permit fee waivers, uh, cover, remove some asphalt that's on the property, and ensure the site's out of the floodplain. We'll provide utilities to the site and a road to the site and a 75-year renewable lease. Um, that's the terms that we've discussed with Gorman. And um, unless you have any questions, uh, we're asking for approval of the resolution tonight. Any questions for Lori? <clears throat> Lori, I, uh, I'm very supportive of this. I'm just, I was reading the development management agreement and in there it says restricting rents to 120% AMI. I think D looks like, yeah, yeah right there. Um, yep. Yep. Isn't it a little lower than that because we're doing 50% at um, at 80, right? But we're, yeah, of, of the rent restrictions, we're, we're um, capping 50% of the units will be rent capped at 80% AMI. And then 40% will be rent capped up to 120 just because right. we have a diverse need in terms of rental units. So are you asking about an overall average? Day? Well, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if I'm reading that correctly. It, it, it states in D, the town desired under the development of approximately specifically local workforce residents with rents largely tied to 120% of AMI. You know, I think the average is going to be lower than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can <clears throat> we can revise the language in the development agreement to match the terms maybe just, and maybe yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, the, the terms are the deal. The most most of the units, fifty percent of the units, will be rent, rent capped at eighty yeah. percent AMI. I just I'm yeah. assuming this is a legal document, so it may be better if we match the terms. You Kimball, are you on? You okay with that, Kimball? I am on and what Lori said is absolutely accurate. I think that was earlier language. Um, and so uh, we can absolutely just tie that to the terms 50% at 80%, 40% at 120, and then the other 10%. So no problem. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kimball. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, so when we say that they're rent capped, does that mean that they're income capped? So it means incomes aren't capped in this scenario? Only 50% of the units are going to have an income cap. Okay. All of 90% are going to have a rent cap. 50% um, are going to have an income cap. Okay. Um, and the, okay. the cap on those, on the income is we're capping them at 100%. And the rents that are being charged is 80%. You just really do need that sort yep. of margin. And then, you know, if they stay there for a while and, and they their income grows, we still allow them to go up to 20% higher before they have to move to a different unit. Is that Alta Verde in her background? Yes. <laughs> it is. I'm floating above the site. Digging as we speak. <laughs> Any other questions? For Lori or for Kimball. Thank you, Kimball. Thanks, Kimball, Lori. Thanks for being such a strong partner.
thanks for uh, your partnership as well. We're excited. Thank you. You know, I always think it's good to point out that this is a loan again, right? And this is the model that we've used with Gorman. I mean, the maximum term would be 40 years, but generally we'd see that payback prior to that. So. Eric, I also want to clarify, Lori refer, uh, referred to this as a development agreement. I don't want to confuse this with a development agreement in the land use development code context. This is actually a development management agreement, which is wow. a different kind of agreement. Very good. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, sir. Tim, can they make uh, can they pass the resolution tonight to uh, adopt this development management agreement with the changes that yes. were being proposed? Yes, in there. Yes, okay, absolutely. Yeah. Eric, one other thing before we move on, yeah. there, we, we have a proposed emergency ordinance that we want to ask the council to add to the agenda. So I know we've moved from ordinances to resolutions, but when we get to the end of the resolutions, may we please go back to the emergency ordinance? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I gotta write it down because I'll forget in the next four minutes. Um, council rules resolution for virtual meetings. This is the same um, document that the council uh, was given two weeks ago. The procedure to amend count, town council rules requires you see it at one meeting and adopt it at the following meeting. It has to be adopted by resolution and that's what this document does. Questions? I know we've been over this quite a few times now. Great. And a resolution to appoint special counsel. Um, for years, the town has used Glenn Porzak as our water attorney. The charter allows the council to appoint <coughs> special attorneys, which you usually do by resolution. And since the, the last firm that Glenn was with has been dissolved, he's created his own firm, Porzak Law. Uh, there's an engagement letter that we showed you in the packet, and so we're asking that the council approve uh, engaging Porsack Loft to be our water attorney uh, via this resolution. Any questions? You have a question about the six minute increments? <laughs> no chit chat when he comes next no time. Right? Yeah. Oh, well, I guess, well, <laughs> about him coming next time. I remember that was a really informative presentation when we've met with him in the past and I know that there are some newer council members that it would at, when it makes sense to have him explain our water rights and that sort of thing at some point yeah, we can do that I'll, uh, excellent we'll look for uh I'd like to say we'll look for a slow meeting but <laughs> I, and I understand that I just I know it was helpful for me when I came on yeah so, water 101 he does yeah. is great and it's really important uh, all right, we have uh, an emergency ordinance. Um, Mark. Thanks, Eric. Council, good afternoon. Um, so we sent this to you earlier today. Tim had its, um, and I think Helen provided it to you. Um, so last year, the council adopted the zero energy ready homes provisions of our building code, um, which was meant to further our uh, sustainability efforts, obviously. Um, and um, at the time we put in a trial training period from July to, through the end of December of 2020 to require contractors and architects that came in to actually go through that program, but not have to comply with all the provisions of it. And um, then as of the first of the year, the compliance was required. Now, what's happened since then, just a couple of things, the county actually decided to extend that trial period, that training period. And theirs is extended through the end of this year currently. Um, we have been contacted by a number of contractors and homeowners that are having issues meet, meeting zero energy ready homes. Um, the intent is good, but I think some of the execution and some of the details are causing problems. A couple of examples of that are if you're proposing an all electric building, you know, you're not going to bring natural gas to the site. The modeling actually kind of penalizes you for that. So we've talked with the Department of Energy about that. They're the, they're the agency that developed this program. 
and they acknowledge that and they're working on providing a fix to that but it's not anything we have at hand right now there's also some issues with um, solar heat gain that um, because of the insulation requirements create you know homes that essentially you got to put an air conditioning in and so it's kind of counterproductive um, so those are a couple examples there's some more that are out there that frankly I, I don't understand all the details with but everyone's acknowledging talking to our building staff here and um, that there are some issues that we need to kind of address I've talked with high country conservation center you know they help facilitate this whole process um, and with Jess Hoover there and Jess is very supportive of us extending this training period. They acknowledge that they need to do more work on preparing materials and having more trainings for the contractors so we can make this happen. And finally, I've talked with Scott Hoffman, building official um, for Summit County. Scott agrees with our approach and he is suggesting that come this fall we have a technical board that will get together we developed the original regulations we'll look at it and try to fine tune those so we absolutely want to move in the direction of of implementing this but at this point in time it's causing issues with some of the builders and i don't think we want to implement it incorrectly we want to have the support i think of the contractors and builders that are out there. So what we proposed is to extend that um, training period. Right now, the way Tim has prepared this, it's, it's indefinite in terms of the time period that that would end at. But really what it says is when the council is ready to adopt and, and require compliance that we would do that. So that's how this is drafted right now. And um, we are suggesting an emergency ordinance so this takes effect immediately and we can let a number of contractors that have been co contacting us and probably you that um, we're going to extend that training period if the council so desires to do so. Excellent. Questions? No, I think that's great and that makes a lot of sense, especially your example where they're potentially the code, how the modeling works is like encouraging the installation of an air conditioning unit. I mean, I don't think that makes sense. And there's a lot within the zero energy ready home that um, we should iron out and glad we'll engage the building community and HC3. And um, I'm fully supportive of extending the training. <clears throat> I finally been getting a contractor to recur my calls. It's nice. I feel like it would be really good if these people who are calling to complain and who have issues are encouraged to stay engaged because this mm -hmm. had a very long public involvement period when lots of contractors and architects were involved. So it's pretty frustrating that, you know, we're just kind of, I feel like we're backing off and I would like to continue to push this forward. So these contractors who are pointing out issues should be encouraged to stay involved in this process. Out of the whole program, I mean, is there, a, you know, would you make a guesstimate that there's 10% of it that needs to be tweaked, i.e. The, the, you know, the windows and the air conditioning, or I mean. I can't even make a guess at that right now, Jeffrey. Is it a lot of stuff or is it just kind I of. I don't think it's a ton of things, but I continue to hear things and yeah. we're meeting. I, I got a call from Craig Campbell, you know, because yeah, he's involved from the windows perspective. And he's like, mm -hmm. I'd love to sit down and explain how it's working on this, a couple of houses that I'm, I'm like, that sounds great. Let's get together and do that. So we really understand what those issues are. And the county is certainly vetting this too. So I think we'll have a good <laughs> list of those issues when we come together later this year to talk about how we get this thing pulled together. And yes, Kelly, we're absolutely want to move in that direction as quickly as we can. <clears throat> I, do think, I do think that some of the builders are discovering this stuff as they go along too. You know, even people that were involved, once this stuff hits the ground and they realize they're spending money to go the other way on some of this stuff, mm -hmm. just doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. Um, and, and I agree with you, Kelly, and I appreciate Mark saying that and Eric. I, you know, I appreciate how constructive some of these engaged contractors have been. And I, and I think that is it exactly is as they're starting to actually utilize it and build it. Some of these, you know, 
things that maybe weren't realized in the field. I, you know, a lot of this stuff, we, the, where we build at, at our climate zone for this stuff, there's nobody else in this climate zone, you know, so the, we're kind of in uncharted territory for some of this. So, yeah, I, I think it makes all the sense in the world. Mark, another contractor I talked to this week said that this code was originally developed for subdivisions at lower altitude and our code was already as good. He does not feel, and he's reputable. He said he does not feel that we're actually building a better home and he would love the time to write a letter and let us know where those, where those um, shortfalls are. So I think by backing off a little bit, we do give them the time to be able to- um, well, They had plenty of time before. No, and I, I agree, so. but now they're actually implementing it. Yeah. And when you start to implement changes that were made, sometimes you, you find out they didn't work as well as we intended. I still would like to keep HC3 at the table. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, and also I'd like to verify the, the, you know, alleged problems, which, you know, could be legitimate. I'd like to make sure we have a kind of an unbiased validation of those, make sure, you know, I can't imagine air conditioning up here. But. Thanks for being flexible on this, Mark. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? questions for Mark on this one? All right. We're going to do this as an emergency ordinance this evening. We'll do it in between um, our second reading and our first reading, Tim. That'd be fine. All right. Great. We got public projects update. Hi, Shannon. Hello. Um, I don't have anything to add to the memo, but I can take questions. How's the dam? Dam is going well. Good. When, when do we start refilling, James or Shannon? Um, fall. We don't have an exact date. We're looking at doing some additional work possibly, but we're still vetting the schedule on that. But we will fill in time for ski season. Okay. Has Jody called you? James? Yes. And yeah, just a little update. And I don't know if Shannon's um, um, heard the latest, but we just met with CSU and Denver Water this morning. So the plan is right now, um, we'll start filling up probably the middle of October. And so I have spoke with both Jody and uh, Jim Teston as well from Avail and, and, and not only assured them, but said we don't anticipate any issues with having water available for- Don't they take most of their water out of the Maggie anyway, or above the Maggie? Isn't pipe. that where the pipe is? No, well, that's their main pump station at the Maggie. So in order for them to have water to pump out of there, we release it from the tarn. Oh. So it all goes down from the tarn to the Maggie and then, then they pump it into their system mm -hmm. on the mountain. So the, the bypass water isn't enough for them to pump out? Correct. Okay. Correct. And are you referring to sawmill? Um, yeah, whatever that one creek. that Carol always complains yeah, that's in, broken. Comes in below, but yeah, there's not enough water that you, comes out of that trip. So. Different Carol. <laughs> <laughs> that is a schedule. Yeah. Again, we don't anticipate any, any uh, issues that would prevent them from being able to make snow. Excellent. So you said starting to fill it in October. Yeah, mid, probably middle of October, maybe maybe just on the front side of the middle of October. Um, but that's when we're looking to um, have the dam ready to impound water for that. Is that a crucial thing for waterfowl, you know, the migrating birds, the tarn? No? They'll find some other water. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah, Maggie Pond. Other questions for James or Shannon on public projects? There is that. And then uh, McCain undergrounding and the uh, bikeway and riverwalk improvements, which we had a nice meeting about last time. <coughs> and fiber. We're getting some dates for the river walk and bikeway. I'll have Peyton send those out to you. Okay. I want to offer two or three meetings around lunchtime on Thursdays and Fridays, if that generally works. That's if great. Not, I can do different, but we'll have the consultant team come. We'll walk the alley sections to start as that's our main focus, but we can brainstorm everything. Okay. <laughs> Could you have Peyton also send us a digital copy of the map we looked I at? I just got that because you had asked me for it and it was a really huge file. So I have to put it on a file share, but I'll get that out to you as well. Okay, thank you. None of us have a device big enough to look at any parts of it is the problem. <laughs> uh, any other public projects, questions? Uh, parking and transportation. Nothing to add. Yeah, nothing to add. Garage looks awesome. Mm -hmm. 
No, no, no. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Child care update. Hey, Lori. Hello, I'm back. Um, I, we did want to go over a couple things in the latest um, packet of minutes from the committee. Um, but before we do that, I um, wanted just to update the council in terms of some staffing changes. I don't know how many people are aware that we have promoted Corey to um, program manager. So Corey is going to be handling, you know, buy downs, housing helps, long term rental incentives all those sorts of things, um, managing the committee meetings. Um, so going forward, that's gonna be great. Um, we have also hired our new project manager who will be running the projects for us. And I think Melanie is in the audience. Hello, <laughs> Melanie Lease. Um, so she'll be coming on board to help us with projects. And then we're still recruiting for the other two positions, but just a quick update on staffing. Um, so on the um, housing committee meeting from the 10th of August, um, I included the minutes in your packet. There were a couple things in there that we wanted to touch base with council on. One of them had to do with um, fee waivers. Um, the committee was supportive of providing fee waivers for ADUs, um, provided the owner would do an 80% rental cap on the ADU. So similar to what we did in Wellington. So this would be fee waivers for ADUs anywhere and um the one that actually came to us was actually located in silver shekel so outside of the town but they used town water so the the water fee was going to be like twelve thousand dollars so um they called to see if there was any sort of incentive program for adus and so the committee supported doing fee waivers and wanted to just make sure the council is also okay with that how do we ensure that those units are used by somebody yeah. as opposed to just the kids when they're home from college the deed restriction requires it 30 hours a week of someone working in town yeah but how do we verify that would be part it of, wouldn't that be part, part of why we're hiring these yeah. compliance positions uh, yeah. to okay. work on our and that's yeah. and that's the other position that Lori's currently interviewing for they're not ready to make a job offer but they have a couple finalists for that but that's that's the type of stuff that just hasn't have the staff or the resources to work on. Yeah. And we need that across the board, right? Like for all of our deeding positions. Yeah. And you know, anything in the upper blue is going to certainly help our workforce. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, any any new ADUs, deed restricted ADUs in, in the upper blue is going to help tremendously. That, that compliance position is not to get confused with short term rental. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. This is just all of our housing restrictions Correct. and making sure those are being followed. Right, right. Lori? Yep. yep. Yeah, that'll help a lot. As long as we can ensure that people get to live there because you get, you know, you get a bit of a boon by getting fee waivers. And then if you just let it sit empty, oh, yeah. and, you know, it's just oh, storage. That doesn't, that I doesn't agree work. With you more, Eric. So, I, I totally agree with you. It's always my ADU issue, yep. as you know. Well, it's really right. any of our deed restrictions, yeah. quite frankly. But yeah. yeah, the ADU is probably more susceptible to it. But if generally you guys are supportive, we'll go ahead yeah. and start making that part of the, you know, ways to eliminate barriers to ADUs. Which is, um, the other thing we wanted to confirm with you all is we, um, we've been working on housing helps, as you know, and it's a fairly simple program. Basically about 15% is what we would compensate somebody for a housing helps deed restriction. Um, we've had um, folks coming to us requesting um, more than 15% and we've had folks coming to us that maybe already had a no short term rental only and then they were willing to accept a employee restriction through the housing helps. And so we talked to the committee last week about instead of just having the one option, which is 15% for housing helps, deed restriction light, um, we would consider sort of a implementing a three-tiered housing helps, <laughs> where um, if you're improving a deed restriction from short-term rental to employee, which is a big benefit because those no short-term rentals in no way ensure that there's going to be a local workforce person in that unit. For example, Kennington, no short-term, but can be retiree, um, can be, you know, 
a person that lives in Denver and comes up and uses it occasionally. So there's benefit definitely in converting anything to employee occupancy. Mm -hmm. So under the three tiered, um, we are considering 10% for an existing no short term, getting it into an employment. We would still have our standard 15% if you're just doing the housing helps pretty light, but it has to be occupied by a workforce. And then um, for somebody that is willing to take a full on heavy deed restriction, with an appreciation cap and everything, then that's worth a lot more to us and maybe up to 20 or 25% even. Um, this came about, I think it was a Kennington person that wanted to buy the unit that they've been leasing. Um, and if they could get 20% from us, then they're willing to accept a full on appreciation cap deed restriction. So it makes sense to us. To I would move go in that direction, three tiered. Having having that three percent appreciation cap is huge, yeah. and I think it's worth easily worth twenty five percent. And this is ensuring you know um, local ownership, local workforce ownership, and I, I I very much support it. How does everybody else feel about that? <clears throat> yeah, I'd use your discretion on that, but I, I'm with Dick. I think if you need to go up to twenty five, yeah. that's fine. But obviously, whatever we can get for less, that's great too. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, the deed restriction, Housing Helps is a super cost-effective way yeah. of getting deed restrictions. Yeah. When we look at the cost for Housing Helps, super low. Um, you know, we'll have to talk to the county to see what they want to do in the unincorporated areas. But these still are very, very um, inexpensive deed restrictions compared to the options of building new construction or something like that. So I would you put it in perspective, if you're purchasing, if it's a $700,000 home and that additional 10% you're willing to pay to get it appreciation cap it's costing you 70 grand and the chances are you know we know what appreciation does in summit county yeah so um that's a pretty inexpensive cost of getting a cap on the growth yeah so. i think it's great i think it makes sense i'm still in favor of the regular housing helps program like that middle going up to 20 percent. i think 15 percent is the bare minimum we should be giving someone for a deed restriction of no short-term rental so and I've had people ask, the, yeah, it's just not worth their while to give up the positive that they are exactly. giving up. And so for the regular housing helps lights, we, we've we had people ask for 18 mm percent -hmm. um, and we've always said no 15 is the cap. But, you know, Vail increased theirs on yeah. their standard housing helps. They're yeah. up to 20 percent. So, um, you know, what we could do is we could do the, um, you know, 10 percent for improving it to a regular from short term rental to, to a housing helps and then up to 20 for standard housing helps and up to 25 for a fully appreciation capped unit. As long as we can continue to verify it and, and right. hope, you know, now that you have a little bit more help, but I also, I think that, I think the housing staff is kind of understaffed, so. We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> They're totally understaffed, but we're getting there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's- Awesome thing about housing helps deed restriction too, is we get that first right of refusal. So we're yeah. in the game, when and if they sell. Absolutely. So if there's if you're supportive, we'll move forward in that direction. I'm all for Kelly's proposal. I think that you know this this really helps local ownership. It's, yeah. it's money well spent. How's everybody else feel, Dennis? Yeah, I'm good with that for sure. I agree. Yeah. Cheaper than building. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, Lori. Question: Was there anything uh, in your meeting about landing locals? Did you discuss that at all? Um. I don't remember if we discussed it, but we've had several, we, we meet monthly with um, Colin, um, Landing Locals, and um, I think um, we're scheduling a date for him to come out and do a presentation with you. Right now he's in the stage where he's interviewing stakeholders. He's talked to a lot of property managers. He's talked to some realtors. He's, I know he's talked to Eric and yep. Um, yep. he's collecting a lot of excellent information on, you know, do, do we and how would we mimic a housing helps or a landing locals program in Breck? And, um, you know, it's really just a way of trying to whatever that gap is and whatever we do need to, to, to provide to the owner to incent them to go to a long term lease. You know, how do we deliver that to the owner? I mean, that's what it's all about. Is it through um, dispersed property managers? So I think he's trying to figure out a process, um, but it's going pretty well. And have you heard of any other HOAs re rescinding their right of first mm -hmm. refusal? No, um, and I don't even know where Gold Camp landed. Um, they, they voted to rescind it. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Enough said. Yeah. I had a call scheduled with Colin for yesterday, uh -huh. and unfortunately, he got chased out of his house due to unhealthy. He lives in Truckee, and he got chased out of his house due to unhealthy air wow. with the smoke. Huh. So he's he had to cancel. So we'll reschedule. Yeah, he he's he's just trying to collect as much information as he can to figure out um, you know how our situation might be similar in some ways to Truckee and then very different from Truckee in other ways. So um, I was really impressed with him. Super. I did not know he was marketing guy from Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> That's where his background is. So his tech background in this housing discussion is all based on his experience with Airbnb and being there, it, it seems like from the beginning when it really was just a tech startup. So, and then he got religion, got religion. <laughs> <laughs> he just changed the way he was feeling about what they were doing. So um, it's really interesting. And he's now branching out around the lake, around Tahoe. They're starting to pick up his stuff all over the place. So it was really, I, you'll really enjoy talking to him. He's I thought it was great. Yeah. And Truckee is kind of similar to us, you know, multiple yeah. jurisdictions, municipalities, you know, obviously they have two states. So having to deal with, you know, hopefully this goes countywide. You know, yeah. It's our goal. Great. Cool. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, and the issues under number four ADUs, the grant would, um, so this is for the county, the grant would have to be paid back if ADU is discontinued. Mm -hmm. What is it? Mean. But that, that's Does a that county program. Using? Yeah, they're trying to figure out how to incentivize ADUs. And so uh -huh. they're, they're still talking about it. And yeah, the committee didn't have a good reaction to you pay back the money if they, if that would be an easy way to get out of your um, ADU obligation. Um, I, I don't think we would go into something like that where you can get out of it by just paying back. Um, but it, um, I just thought it was interesting that the committee be aware of what the county was thinking about. I think um, we're thinking about some um, potential modifications to the development code on the positive point sort of thing. And I know that's going to come to you at some yeah. point. And do they, so would discontinue, does that mean that, so in the county, because I'm not as familiar, can they short-term rent their ADUs, or would that just be if they were using it, if they decided to use it for a family member exactly. or for something like that? Okay. Exactly. Any way that they were using the ADU in violation of it being an employee unit. So okay. they either stop using it entirely and it turns into a bigger living room or storage. A den or storage. Yeah. Um, if there's not an employee in there, um, then that would be the penalty. But I think okay. they're still in the early stages of figuring out what their program's going to be. Thank you. Excellent. Other questions on any other thing, anything else to highlight? Um, no, um, child care minutes were in there as well. I don't know if you have any questions on those, um, that report, but it's all good stuff. Cool. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Congratulations, Corey. He's been That's aboard. Awesome. She's just getting the bump. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, Lori. All right, committee reports. Is there anything? I don't think so. Zero. And uh, financials. Hello, Brian. Hey, Brian. Brian. I look good in that picture. <laughs> we look like we're hardworking. You, you not so much. Yeah, well, this one. Yeah. yeah. I'm not used to manual labor. I might frame that one. I look like I know what I'm doing with a shovel. My face is all in the livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as you can see from the financials that we have in the packet, our, our, our level of business activity has returned to what we've been comparing to in the 2019 levels, really since January. Um, which was comparable to 2019 as well. But since then, we've been at or above those levels. Um, and in particular, in the last month, we saw um, these go up through June. Give me a second. You know, we've seen June really surpass uh, the 20, even the 2019 levels of you know, normal business activity. So we're, we are having uh, a lot of activity in town this summer. Heather did run the preliminary July returns. That came in at 75 million. So that, that's a really good February. Um, that would be our biggest July by a, a long shot. Yeah. So what we're seeing in town is bearing out in the numbers. It's really crowded, it's really busy. Yeah. So that is flowing all the way through the financials in terms of cash collections, you know, real estate transfer tax. You guys see how that is continuing at, at a, a, an accelerated pace, it seems. And um, rent. 
for August to date is at 522,000 versus 602,000, which is, uh, doesn't compare to what we had. We had a million dollars in rent last August. So we've been seeing these million dollar months pop up almost at random with no real, real trending to them like we've had in the past. So we don't know if we have another, some of those in store generally for RET, the fall tends to be the big RET season. Uh, the theory being that's the summer shoppers kind of closing on those properties. So we'll see where that goes, but that's ahead of budget as well. Not ahead of prior year, but prior year was, was gangbusters. So we'll see where it goes. Um, as far as the expense side of things, we are still adhering to, well, I shouldn't say we're adhering to, but we are comparable to the reduced budget levels we put in place when we were making the budget back in 2020. Uh, we are, as you've seen, hiring positions, no longer holding as many positions vacant, but I think we, we have a lot of forced vacancies, which are keeping our budget levels uh, comparable to what we did budget for in 2020. So um, with the revenue side being up and holding to those levels that we set back in 2020, um, we'll, we'll have a lot to talk about at the, at the, at the retreat. Excellent. Questions on finances? Brian. Rentals are doing awfully well. Yep. I mean, looking all the way back to 18, they're huge increases every <clears throat> month over name? month, year after year, year over year. Just short term rentals. Oh, right, right. They're leading the pack by far. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of revenue generation, you know, that, that's the highest tax sector because there's the additional accommodations tax. So, in terms of revenue, that's. I'm just comparing year to year, which is yeah. apples to apples. So. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else? No. We're going to our plastic ban bag bag ban. September first, <laughs> right? Um, are we getting questions from businesses, or um, how's that rollout going? I've, I've gotten some comments. You know, it, it just supply on the recycled bags is very tight right now. It's hard for I've heard some restaurateurs, you know, particularly the bags with the hoops that many that are favored by the restaurateurs, and you know, I guess. For me, I think we, we keep the ordinance in place, keep the, the deadlines in place and, and maybe, you know, kind of similar to to the, the building ordinance, maybe we go soft in enforcement for a few months and let, let supply chains catch up. Because like Shamrock, one of our major distributors has zero, none. Yeah, well, amongst other things. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I just, I am not, suggesting that we back off on the ordinance i just think maybe we we go light on enforcement maybe till the first of the year I mean, to allow for supply i know chase. city mark is planning on that september one day so yeah yeah and i'm not suggesting we change you know that but i just light on in enforcement maybe we won't throw anybody in jail yeah hundred thousand dollars there you go <laughs> is that everything we do now i like that um, all right, Brian, thank you. Um, can we jump to the McCain parcel service commercial plan since we still have about 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Is that James? Uh, James? Uh, we're going <laughs> to jump to your uh, service commercial, the McCain plan. I want to make sure everybody that planned on being here at four has the opportunity to be here at four. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I was... Sorry, man. Um, yeah, well, hopefully everyone has had a chance to read the memo I had as part of the packet, but this was follow up to the discussion that we had approximately a month ago. And at that um, meeting, we had talked about kind of the, um, the modification to the McCain master plan. And as part of that, there were some of the areas that those tracks were identified. And one of the major changes that kind of caught uh, folks, um, maybe a little bit off guard, but not intended to be, was just the fact that we had um, striked out the service commercial area. And um, staff heard um, the discussion that occurred after that, and we um, have worked with the individuals that are currently on that service in that service commercial area, and um, with the intent to uh, kind of by recommendation and some of the discussion to. Kind of partner and kind of you know kind of both use that property moving forward um, i've also had a chance to chat with mark Truckee and com dev in terms of um, a way to kind of capture what the intent of the modification is and then also um as, as what kind of spawned this whole discussion 
capture some area for the future for public works. So um, I had an opportunity to meet with one of the, the leases on the property. And what we really um, verbally kind of was able to agree to was is that over time, we'll do a reduction of the area that's being currently utilized. Both, both the, the area in total right now is about four and a half acres of the seven and a half acres that was kind of identified as track two. And so uh, the time frame that I put on it is kind of a four to 10 year time frame, meaning that as we start to pace out toward closer to that 10 years, they'll, they'll reduce down to an area of somewhere in the neighborhood of um, one acre each or maybe two acres in, in some total. So that, that seemed to be agreeable to, to the current leases. And I think in review of um, public works needs and kind of um, putting that and uh, reconciling that with some of the development that's gonna be taking place over the next 10 years. I believe that's something that can work for public works and retain that service commercial um, um, uses. Excellent. So at a newly negotiated rate that yeah. we feel is a little more uh, equitable in today's market. So good. Any questions? No, just thank you. Is that a win win. Yeah, thank Great. you for working that out. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Does 10 years feel like the right amount? Because that seems like a very long time to. Well, as some of the conversation, Kelly, was really um, it's driven by development. So, you know, if we stay on this current current pace, you know, that 10 years will probably come around pretty quick. But if, you know, as things ebb and flow a little bit, um, we do have the ability to, to adjust on that. Okay. A lot of it goes through Block 11 development. And, um, you know, as we kind of um, continue with the McCain area. So 10 years does... Well, it seems like a long time. I, I think that'll... Well, what we told them also is we know for the next few years, we can work with you to get that site down because, you know, but as our need changes, we're going to need it greatly reduced and we can't promise anything too far out in the future. But at least we're given some certainty over the next three to five years of what's happening. And, you know, then it could be that if it could be that a, a, a one acre model per lease is a workable model for us, but we won't know until that time comes, right? So, yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, able to work out the driveway situation with the bunkhouse? Um, we do have a plan. I actually have a meeting with um, um, those folks tomorrow or with the bunkhouse tomorrow to discuss that. Um, there's a couple other aspects about that, but I think we will be able to work out that. that Great. We're not anticipating that to be an issue is providing cool. access. Thanks for that. Thanks, James. Hey, one other thing I want to, Kelly and I had a discussion. This is really more for Truckee and potentially for Tim as time goes on. But um, Kelly and I were having a discussion about the open space. And it might be time for us to start having a discussion about creating a new land use district that encompasses all the, all the open space that we buy as a town that has some different, maybe an, another layer of restriction on it so that as time goes on and Warner gets reelected to mayor, he doesn't start selling stuff off. <laughs> that's, that, that's where this, um, this, the genesis of this, Kelly was asking some questions and we had talked about this early on and then I forgot about it. So um, if that's something we can start thinking about at least at some point, Kelly, does that sound? Mm -hmm. Legit. Yeah. All right. So we took like a just like a conservation, you know. I mean, this money comes from a tax from taxpayers, and their understanding is that they're paying into open space, and that doesn't mean like today paying into open space, tomorrow paving it over for a parking lot. Yeah, I, I think that you know the town's been very fortunate to have councils since the inception of the open space tax that believed in open space and would never do that. But I, I think it is. You know, if for the future, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a wouldn't we awesome do that way with, to go. Wouldn't we do that with all of our open space? Yeah, we put that, everything. In, I think that's yes. what. Yes. When I when we acquire open space, that's that has always been my understanding that that's not touchable. So yeah, yeah it, it actually is. is. Crazy, right. it's a totally. <laughs> so if, we, if that's a misstep, then yes, absolutely. But you could only do it on on that open space that lies within the jurisdictional boundaries of the town, town boundary, not yeah. outside the town. Where we have would, zoning authority. It would be a lot more challenging when it's co-owned with the county anyway, I would imagine, because you have to go through the county as well. Like there's kind of a 
I think it has open space zoning. So, and does that include our co-owned land? Okay, so that's great. Probably that's does, yeah. yeah. So, great. So we're covered anyway with those. Well, for them, yeah, for those. All right, James, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody need to take a quick five while we get ready for this next section? All right, we're gonna take five minutes and come back with uh, the short-term rental cap discussion. I want to give Jeffrey time to take a few breaths before you. <laughs> <laughs> You're torturing for like Jeff. That, that's still in that. Yeah. You do it in PowerPoint? I guess I should. Know. I think there's a few people on this land that are upset about that. Because Eric doesn't want a whole lot of presentation at the start. Well, but let's see what you're showing. What? All right. Next on the docket is a short term rental cap discussion. I'm sure that's why all of you are here, since you all just walked in. Let me start with a couple uh, rules of the road for council chambers. Um, first of all, this is civil discourse. And while we all have different opinions, and different ideas of these topics, there will be no, um, no booing, no shouting, no shouting at somebody that's at the lectern. Um, in general, we don't take public comment during work session, but council feels this is important enough that we're going to open the floor. So we will have a uh, staff presentation, council discussion. We'll open it up to um, public comment. Public comment will be, you know, we've got about, we've got a, an hour reserved on the schedule, but we'll let it go longer than that. Um, you get three minutes to present whatever you are there to present. And I know it's difficult to stand up in front of people and talk. So we're pretty patient with that kind of stuff. If somebody before you or a string of people have all said the same thing, it's fine just to get up and say, hey, I agree with Dr. Warner or, or whatever. That's completely legit. The podium is here. Give us your name. Um, you don't have to tell us how long you've been in town. That's honestly, in the end, pretty irrelevant. Um, but let me reiterate, this is all about civil discourse, not um, being the loudest guy does not make his point in this room. Um, just as another FYI, the way the timeline works on these kind of things, um, we're in a five Tuesday month. So tonight, the, the discussion may or may not end up with us asking staff to draft, draft legislation, excuse me, legislation. If we decide to, that that's the route we wanna go, in three weeks, we will have the first reading of potential legislation. There will be public hearing at that meeting. Two weeks later, there will be a second reading also with public comment. If that passes on both of those readings, it is a 35 day waiting period until something goes into effect. So in essence, hopefully my calculation is right, November 2nd would be to the day that this would go into effect. Just to give some of you who may be in the middle of um, building or buying that, you know, so you understand there's a couple months before anything actually happens. Government never moves fast, that's for sure. Um, we could do it as an emergency ordinance, but we don't feel that that is acceptable um, with, with the things that we're trying to resolve. Um, so that's the timeline um, and the rules of the road. So we're gonna start with our town manager, Rick Holman, um, and then the staff with some information and then we'll, we'll chat and then we'll open it to you. Rick. Thank you. I really don't have a lot to say to set the stage here. I want to, uh, we're gonna start with a short staff presentation. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail because you have memos in the packet. Memos have been made available to the public. Primarily, uh, Lori and Leslie will be available for additional questions that come up from the council. <clears throat> with that being said, there are a couple of items that we want to highlight as we start this off, so. And we did provide you with, uh, in front of you, an updated matrix, which kind of shows you some other towns to compare to. Um, so that's a little bit more updated than what was in the packet. And because we have a lot of people here, let's just make sure we're really talking to the mic. 
Lori. Oh, um, well. <laughs> when it's your turn. <laughs> uh, when it's my turn, I guess it's my turn. I'm, I'm Lori Best and I manage the um, housing program for the town of Brack. I've been doing that for almost 20 years. Um, and I think everybody um, is feeling that we've been facing some unique challenges in terms of being able to provide housing for our workforce. Um, multiple trends contributing to that. But um, on, on the slide, you know, we recently did a um, needs assessment. It came out in 2019, that was pre-COVID. Um, and it highlighted a couple sort of alarming trends. I mean, we are losing employees countywide. Um, you know, the number of people that are working in our community has dropped 20%. It's a loss of 3000 employees that were here in um, 2010 and are no longer here. So that loss of employees um, is obviously concerning to our business sector and to, to us as a community. Um, since 2010 also, um, you know, that issue of, of sort of trying to pro provide housing to cover a certain percentage of the jobs in town. Um, in 2010, 40% um, of the jobs that are in the upper blue were filled by residents of the upper blue. Um, since then, um, that's dropped only 27% of the jobs in the upper blue being filled by residents of the upper blue. So significant jobs, um, more people in commuting um, to, to provide the labor necessary to sustain the um, local businesses. Um, and to, since 2010, also sort of the, the number of resident occupied homes versus sort of vacation homes, that balance has also shifted significantly. Um, in 2010, 37% of the homes were resident occupied. And by 2018, only 29% are resident occupied with the balance being vacation homes. So um, I think, um, you know, that's, that's what we're working on in the housing program is trying to ensure that we have adequate housing for our local workforce. Um, you know, I think previously we've talked about trying to have, you know, 30 to 35% of the inventory should be resident occupied and 60, 65% should be um, vacation rental, something else. Um, so the challenges are, I guess, that we're, we're sort of falling behind despite the fact that we've continued to add new de-restricted units. So, um, I mean, that's all I have to say in terms of kicking off the conversation is a little bit of the challenges we're seeing. Could you, could you give us a, uh, not, not the whole thing obviously, but just kind of an overview of what some of the comparable communities are doing, uh, what type of programs they've implemented uh, to... Uh... Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to find a comparable community. It's hard to find a community that has uh, over a thousand short-term rentals. You know, we're pushing 4,000 now, which is over 50% of our housing stock. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer as far as comparable. However, um, you know, there are some other mountain towns on here. Um, you know, Crested Butte, they have uh, 209 licenses in total. They do have um, some caps in certain areas of their community. They, they kind of have a zoning approach here. Um, Denver, while they don't have any caps, they do have a rule regarding um, that you must have, a, you can only rent out your primary residence. Um, Durango, they have a limit of a certain number per block. Um, Estes Park also has a cap. They uh, currently though have 322 in residential areas and they do have a waiting list. Um, there are no um, similar restrictions to any other communities within Summit County, um, but Georgetown is close by, Leadville is close by. They're both listed on here um, with their limitations and their caps. Um, Salida as well. What does Salida do? I can't find it here. So Salida, they One. currently have 200 listings oh. um, online and- They do it by neighborhoods and blocks. They yeah. limit the number in a particular block, I believe. In Salida, One, right? One per block in residential areas. And they have a much more of a defined traditional residential versus yeah. commercial area than what we do. And then you have some other communities like Steamboat and Telluride who haven't currently done anything, but Steamboat currently has a moratorium. Um, they're still deciding what they're going to do. Um, and then Telluride has limits per calendar year. Um, and they have 723 listings. Oh, I see. So Steamboat, Steamboat has a 90 day moratorium. Correct. Okay. So does that help give you a little yeah, bit of information? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. We have the ability to put that pie chart up that was in our packet. Uh, we have a similar pie chart. Um, Which one are you looking for? Uh, page one of 11 that was in. So this pie chart here, the green represents short-term rentals, but it is divided up between um, properties that are um, in the exempt areas. So exempt would be a property that operates like a hotel and they have a front desk, they have 24 hour security um, and they have a phone system where you can pick up a phone in your unit to call the front desk if there's an issue. Um, so that light gr that green in total is the short-term rentals which is slightly over uh, 50%. And then the um, blue sections represent homes that are actually occupied by the resident in town. So that speaks to where we would like to see up around the 30 to 35% mark. Yeah, and on, the, on this slide, I think it's important to note that the 13% the of the units are deed restricted employee occupied units. The 16% that are resident occupied those are not deed restricted. They may include retirees. They may include remote workers. Um, there, some portion of those are likely market rate units that do have employees living in them. But that bucket of sixteen percent is split between sort of three different household types. And one other thing I should point out is that the most recent information we could get was from Dola, which is where this information is from. Um, and that was from 2019. They haven't issued two 2020 numbers or anything more recent than that. So, you know, we could only speculate that perhaps this has actually gotten even worse. Can we see the heat map? Because that, that tells a, a, another story, you know, the, uh, to see. Uh, so we can click on the link up. There we go. So this map here has two numbers on properties. The um, blue numbers tell you the total number of licenses that are in that complex. And then the red numbers are telling you that those um, are units that have changed since 2012. So they've gone from not a short-term rental to now they are a short-term rental. Is there a particular area you'd like us to zoom in on? No, I just thought that would give a, a little bit of different story from the pie chart, but it's sort of hard to, it's a little more. You could you click on like Gold Camp where that 68 is. Gold Camp. Up to, Gold. yeah, right there. There's 66 total yeah. licenses. Yeah. 66. So if you click on that, you should be able to see. But you also uh, have people's names in there. Yeah, if we, if you could just zoom in a little bit yeah, zoom more. In. Thank you. Okay, so here you can see there, there that's go. Gold Camp with the 66 in that dark brown and the 30, there's 34 units in that complex that have changed that they were previously not a short term rental and now they are a short term rental. That red number is a change from 2012? Correct. So anything that has changed since 2012, yep, is included in that red number. Now, did you say that we've lost 3,000 employees? Is that what you said? Um, right? Yeah, on that first county slide. Um, countywide. That, that's a countywide number. In, and that's from 2010? Right. Yeah. The, right now, there are um, 3,000 less working employees in Summit County than there were back then. You know, it'd be, you know, I know you can't just bring it, pull it out of your hat. It'd be interesting to know the visitors ship or the, the amount of visitors we had in 2010 <clears throat> compared to 2020, 2021. And, you know, kind of the per capita uh, chance of uh, getting service at uh, some of our businesses. And the additional number of businesses exactly yeah. the last 11 years. Yeah. The additional jobs, yeah. like the actual jobs that but, have been created in that <clears throat> deficit. Yeah. We have traffic data going back, so we know our traffic data has you know, seen that significant increase in a number of cars per day entering and leaving town at the north end. So, um, you know, we know it's significant. You know, my fear is the Breckenridge product is diminished. I think it's, it's, it's been that way. It's coming head in that direction for a few years now. I just don't think we're as good of a host as we could be uh, often because our work staff is overworked, our businesses are understaffed. And the fact that just the, the sense of being vested in the community is not what it used to be. And so that's that's what worries me. Uh, that as far as the whole Breckenridge brand is uh, 
it, you know, it's, it's, it's diminished. And I, I agree with you, Jeffrey, that's well said. I also, my fear in addition to that is the character of our town has changed so much. And, um, you know, we, we were charged as a council with our primary goals, the destination management plan to fiercely protect the character of Breckenridge. And, and for me, that, that's a lot of what this discussion is about. Because I do believe that, that the, the increase of the short-term rentals in, in the community as a whole, in our neighborhoods, in our traditional workforce housing complexes uh, like Gold Camp and Valdezera and all the others has, has tremendously changed the character of this town. And, um, you know, so that's, that's why I'm willing to have this discussion. I look forward to hearing people's comments and I appreciate everyone being here on both sides. And I hope we can have a, a uh, we can be better in Breckenridge and have a good discussion. Part of the stage that we want to set for the council, obviously, is that you know we look at right now, fifty-two percent of our housing stock has some type has a short-term rental license on it, which is more than almost any community that we're aware of. When you look at that percent, we look at the last we look at the last five years. And we have 534 more licenses today than we had in July of 2016. 500. So, you know, is it time for is it time to put a cap, a ceiling on what we want those licenses to be, so that five years from now we don't have another 500 and we're at 60 plus percent of our housing stock being well, short-term rentals. And Rick, we look at the data we have on short-term rental sales on the tax collections. I mean, it's great to have the revenue to work with, but that's not what it's all about. What it's about is, is the character of this town, the quality of life, the ability to work and live in this community. And, um, you know, the revenue's just gone off the charts okay. in the last And I, I mean, so. there are people that have put in a cap and there are very, there are several others that are having the same conversations that we're having because they don't want to get to the place that Breckenridge is at right now. And it's the balance too, right? Like it's the balance of how much demand these STRs create and how much more, you know, restaurant, retail, grocery that the STRs create too. And I feel like we're a bit out of balance as we talk about community and that sort of thing and creating this need for more employees, exasper exacerbating the problem, I think, that's another part of the conversation too, is that as we add more short-term rentals, it, it creates more of a need for more employees who can't find housing. And, and I just feel like our balance is a bit out of whack. Yeah, that's well said. Erin, I agree completely with you. There is a place for short-term rentals within our community. We've said it over and over again. We don't have enough traditional lodging. We absolutely need short-term rentals, but the issue is our balance is lost where our trajectory is troubling. So going back to our destination manager, management plan vision statement, harmony of quality of life for residents and quality of place for visitors. And I'm just getting back to a place of balance. I think balance is the key word. You know, and I don't see this, if, if, we, do, if we do impose a cap, I don't see this being the be all end all fix. I think this will perhaps lessen the bleeding for uh, uh, several months, giving us time to implement some other programs, incentivizing long uh, short-term rentals to go to long-term. If if there is a a balance point where we can kind of kick in some bucks to get people to switch over, uh, some some maybe um, tweaking our licensing fee. I mean, there's there's programs that we've been working on that we are working on, and and have for quite some time that I think this would just give us maybe time to have some, some of them come to fruition. And this will just give us a little bit of breathing room because I think we're in a triage situation right now. And, and so we have to do, I think we have to do something and uh, we'll see if everybody else thinks that. I, you know, I think there, it's important for the audience to understand that this has been an ongoing conversation. I've actually sat down with many of you in the room or taken phone calls with many of you in the room about, you know, I wouldn't rent my house to a local anyway. Well, that's not, 
this has gone beyond. This may have started as a housing crisis for us. This has gone beyond that. This has become a quality of life in Breckenridge. This has become a fabric of our community issue. So it's it's beyond this this discussion where are we going to house everybody. You know, we're building 80 units right now. We're going to build 150 to 200 in the next round. The council's constantly builds units for employees, and you know, I, we, we constantly hear, well, when I moved here, you know, I couldn't find a place either. It is more way past that. You know, it, it might have been one thing when you first moved to town, you worked at the ski or you couldn't get a job. The people that can't find jobs now are administrators in our hospital, administrators in our school system, transit drivers. I mean, th this is not... This is not what it has always been. That needle between short-term and long-term rental has really moved past a, a state of balance that it used to really have. And we have now, I think, moved into an area where it is time for the council to discuss these things. So this is not just about housing. We have, many, um, we have a many-pronged approach to housing. This is part of it. We have a many pronged approach to the fabric of what we do, you know, why we all moved here. I mean, why people want to have a short term rental in Breckenridge is because of what Breckenridge offers. But there are many neighborhoods now that have gone from being um, peaceful residential areas to commercial enterprises in their neighborhoods. You know, and you can, we can debate this point all day long, but these are short term rentals. Well, we are a short-term rental town, and I have said this in virtually every meeting. That's how we lodge guests. We, there are still commercial enterprises in residential areas. That, that's what they are. And, you know, to have one in your, on your block is one thing. But once we exceed that, and, you know, all of a sudden you're surrounded by nobody but guests that come in here every three days for a, for a good time, and, you know, good for them. I mean, that's the beauty of Breck. That's what we do. That's our job. But, but to, to give up the sanctity of your life for this now, I think is really, that's why we're having this discussion. That's what this is really about. This is partially about housing, but this is truly about the fabric of our community, which is why it is so important to have you all in this room and to allow you all to say your piece today. And that's why we're going to do this two more times after today, because we do really, you know, we believe in Breckenridge, like all of you do. Listen, nobody in this room is here because they don't love this town. That I know. But we have different opinions about things, and we'll see where we shake out. So, other comments? I just would say, this is not a taking. If you have a license, you're going to have your license. What this is, is maybe slowing down the growth of license to the to the point where we have some some breathing room okay let's hear what they have to say all right okay we'll start taking some public comment um we'll start with james and then dr warner and then after that if you guys just want to you want to form a line conga line you can do that remember three minutes there are a lot of people here we do have other business on the docket tonight and we're going to keep track of the times. And we're going to keep track. Rick's going to Rick's going to give me that three minute warning. So, uh, sorry, James, give us your name and hello. Uh, hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James. I'm a local business owner here. James, what's your last name? Vecchio. I'll try and speak fast, and I apologize for any redundancy from any prior comments. My girlfriend and I decided to move here and invest in the town of Breckenridge in May of 2018. We made this decision to get away from the big city life and enjoy the utter beauty of the Breckenridge scenery and year round sunshine. We also love the community feel that Breckenridge once was and that it is large enough of a town that you don't feel missing anything. Sorry. And if you need something important like tires or see a movie, Lowe's, Walmart, Target, et cetera, you can take a short ride down to Frisco or Silver Point. We do not feel that the community vibe we saw back in 2018 exists anymore. Eric, Eric recently mentioned at one of our Zoom talks that he starts off his morning routines for years and years with going to the Crown almost every day, seeing everyone he knows in the community, and now he is lucky to run into anyone. 
is the town of Breckenridge, the next Vale Village of the case only, or has it already become that? I have great customers that have sold their homes and left the community because of this and some are over 23 year residents. And then a few real estate agents who have said, what is going on is outright absurd, but of course can't talk in today's forum without being ostracized by their colleagues. For some in the real estate community to say, leave it all alone, it won't correct itself, or commute from Leadville or Georgetown, how about I rent your house and you guys commute from Georgetown or Leadville? Me and my employees can live in your home. We moved to Breckenridge to live in this gorgeous town. I'll walk over and shake your hand if you're just honest and say it's a capitalistic society and you're getting yours. But please do not insult our intelligence and say this can occur and solve itself and that there isn't even a problem. You know firsthand there is because even some of your favorite places in town have had to adjust their hours or close days because of the shortage of employees due to lack of housing. When are enough visitors enough? When is enough revenues enough? This is the question that is important to answer in order to get back to our community feel and have a fair balance. The town does have all the statistics as mentioned just a little while ago. The statistics that weren't there from 2010 were how many businesses have grown. Grand Colorado on peak eight, the residents in on Ridge. James, that's the time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. It's just not sustainable, guys. Thanks, Thank James. you, James. Dr. Warner. John Warner, for the record. Um, I just want to make three points, and I'll back it up with some numbers. I'm not here to propose an increase in property taxes because that can't be done at this level. But I want you to be aware of a couple of things. The Upper Blue Sanitation District increased rates for short-term rentals. They backed it up with effluent flow studies. They were sued, they won at the Supreme Court, and they have almost doubled their rate for short-term rentals. That's straight from Andy Carlberg from a couple days ago. It's on their website if you want to read about it. If you look at, and I think Dick said it well, or no, Eric said it well, we're creating commercial enterprises in residential communities. Well, in the state of Colorado, commercial property taxes are two and a half times higher than residential or owner-occupied property taxes. So just as a base, if you don't think about property taxes, if a 2,000 square foot home was being rented as a short-term rental, they'd be paying, if they were paying the commercial rate, they'd be paying about $5,000 a year. They're only paying about $2,000 a year. 5,000 square foot house, 13,000 versus about 8,000 or 7,000. So there's a huge discrepancy. I'm, not say, I'm just giving you a context to work with that they aren't paying their fair share. So number one, I'd like to see you put a cap on STRs. I'd also like you to create a goal of reducing SDRs. If your gap is 2,500, in the next five years, let's get down to 2,000. Buy them off, let them uh, go away via attrition, you name it. I think we might be much healthier if we had 500 fewer STRs. Mm -hmm. The other thing, and this goes to somebody else's point, it's not just this thing, this cap. I think we should reinvigorate or reinvent the Joint Upper Blue Master Plan, sit down with the county, the town of Blue River, town of Breckenridge, and think this through. This is not a one-off fix. We need the whole basin, the Upper Blue Basin, thinking about that. I served on joint, the Joint Upper Blue Master Plan in 1996, worked very well. Unfortunately, we didn't think about short-term rentals. So my bad. The last thing is, I think we should go after the school district in particular. They have tons of land. They don't understand employing or housing their employees, and they should. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, well, that was shocking. <laughs> Jesus. I don't know what happened. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, I'm Alex Lamarca, Crepes a la carte. Been here for quite a while, but when I first moved to Colorado, I think I visited Brackenridge. I visited Steamboat, Aspen. I remember a joke in Aspen that they used to tell that they said the millionaires would be pushed out by the billionaires. So I moved to Breckenridge. Um, and really, it uh, seems like now that those billionaires are starting to catch up and make their way over to this side of the hill. Um, at that, I've uh, opened up a second location. And back in 2016, was when we got started, um, opened about 10 months of the year back then at the second location, and we're doing about half a million dollars in business. Now, this year, I think actually I, I can employ up to where about 40 uh, employees is what my business can handle. Um, and this year now, that second location is now open two months of the year due to the lack of employees. Um, and at that too, I know as Breckenridge, we have our seasonal goes. I mean, from 30 employees in a, in a winter season, I'd go down to maybe like 10 to 15 employees. This year, we're down to four employees, four full-time employees. And I mean, pretty much right after I get done with my speech here, I'm back to work. Um, at that, uh, definitely in years past, I mean, even this time of the year, we'd find we'd put out applications and we'd find that uh, there be a few applications that come back. This year, uh, we have our ads out and we've gotten zero applications. Nobody's coming looking for jobs. Um, we're raising our rates. We're hiring people upward $20, $25 an hour. I mean, and then I kind of wonder where am I going to go here this next month? Am I going to go up to hiring at $25 in, in December? Am I going to be hiring at $30 an hour? Uh, I look at the uh, housing rates for somebody to rent a house around here, $1,500 to $2,000 a room. I mean, having to pay between 60 to, uh, Eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year for one employee to be able to afford to live up here. Um, so, I definitely feel that there's a little bitterness around town with pe people moving away, and I think it's yes, it's definitely more than just the availability of housing. I think there's going to have to be a reach from the town and to actually bring people, quality workers, back to the town. Um, I mean, I definitely had my fair share of high school workers this year and thank God for them. But, you know, I mean, we, we need some people that are going to stick around. Definitely people move up here and their group of friends, four, five, six people, they all rent the house and maybe they can afford the rent for that house that year. And then usually about one, two of them would decide, oh, hey, Brackenridge is a place for me and I want to stick around this town. But now for them to stick around and grow up and have that house on their own, you're not going to cut it at $40,000. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. My name is Devin O'Neill. Uh, thank you for allowing public comment at a work session, A. Eh? Uh, before I forget, I want to second what John said. I don't think just to caps the answer here, I think we need to bring the number down. And if it doesn't come down by natural means, uh, there need to be other measures taken. Um, I think it's important to remember, you used to have to actually call a lodging company to rent a house or a condo. Then you would like mail in a deposit. Now the whole thing takes 20 seconds. So it's not just, well, this is how it's always been and we're getting busier. It's like the, the equation is completely changed. So when we think about um, how we need to manage it, we have to adapt the management equation to those changes. Um, you know, we should not penalize an industry simply for improving its model. But if we look the other way and say, well, this is kind of just how it's always been. We've always been a short-term rental town. Like, absolutely not. In this case, these issues that it brings are profound and they affect all of our quality of lives, as you guys put it very well earlier. Um, you know, <laughs> the... <laughs> Young ones and growing families used to live here, young locals, 20s. I, I got here at 22, you know, I think a lot of people did. And, and they wanted to fight for the quality of life that was available here. People are moving away now and saying, good riddance, I'm out of here, screw you Breckenridge. And we go so far out of our ways 
to give the guests a good experience. And our locals are not getting that. And I think that they need to be, we need to be prioritized differently and better and more urgently um, in that regard. Real quickly, uh, um, you know, we all get frustrated. This is an example of what, what the trickle down here, which gets lost because it's not measurable, but we all get frustrated when the resort doesn't open their awesome terrain early enough. Well, there's a good friend of mine who has been a ski patroller for a long time, and it takes years to be qualified to go up and run an avalanche route. And he lived in a long-term rental house with a few friends, and suddenly that house sold. And he has been here eight years, and he didn't know if he'd be able to stay. And luckily, that owner, of course, he raised the rent on them, but um, he's allowing them to continue living there. And he said, I would have moved otherwise. And so Boom, there goes one more AVI, AVI control master and suddenly we're all like standing in lines again. And this quality of life is very deep and uh, it doesn't just happen directly. Um, I usually stay out of politics. I think a lot of us do who are here among this silent majority, but you know, this issue is basically our everything right now. And I think all of us agree. Um, you know, I think everyone who came to this meeting, as Eric said, cares about Breckenridge, but if you remove the financial conflict of interest of benefiting directly from short-term rentals, I bet only some of us would still be arguing for what we're arguing for today. And when you think about weighing the future of this town, I think that's really important to consider. Thanks, Thank you for doing what's best for such a special place. Thanks, Debbie. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Teague uh, Holmes. Thanks for allowing the public comment and um, all of the um, intelligent growth and work that you all have put in over all the years. So um, I just wanted to tell uh, just a couple of basic stories. I have an employee who's been with me for three years. Um, tree climbers are tricky to find unique uh, unique skill set. And tree climbing in Summit County is pretty different than other places. And I've chosen Breckenridge again and again for 23 years, and I choose to run a business. Um, my employee named Chris has looked at 16 homes. He's trying to get out of a trailer that he bought in, in Park County. He's a single parent with a little girl, a little two and a half year old girl. And He's, he's been, you know, 40,000 over asking cash offers again and again, 16 times. Um, and he's just trying to find a better life for his girl and I'm continually trying to take care of him. Um, another guy, Ken, um, I had a conversation with him the other day. He's, he's lived in Breckenridge for 32 years renting long-term for 32 years. He's a master electrician. He's got a great job with a great builder, takes really good care of him, and his home is selling uh, where he's lived. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's, I guess it's you know an illegal lock-off or something like that. There's something that doesn't comply. And I just think it's ironic that he you know, chooses to live this simple life here in Brick Breckenridge, and then he he doesn't know where he's going to live. He doesn't, and, and, uh, and the folks that are potentially buying the place, we don't know what they're going to do with it, but if they want to use that space or rent that space, they need him to come into compliance with, um, with the remodel on that place, but he can't live here. And I think that's just a bit yeah. ironic. So this is a complicated issue, and I can't begin to know how to improve uh, the lives of of locals in the work workforce here retain this housing, but we look to you to help us with that. Thank you. Thanks, Teague. Kim. Hi, my name is Kim McGahey. I'm a Breckenridge resident. Uh, there's a notion circulating around Summit County that short-term rentals are the problem and that eliminating them is the solution. This economic heresy cannot be farther from the truth. First though, we must identify the severity of the problem before we can craft a reasonable, if necessary, solution. As proposed by a recent petition drive intended to force the town of Frisco Council to vote on a short-term lodging ban, the problem in the petitioner's eyes is the lack of affordable local workforce housing. Their solution is to outlaw short-term rentals and convert those lodgings to long-term rentals for local workers. 
On the surface, this redistribution of wealth seems reasonable and fair until you look more closely at the local economic damage such a redistribution would cause and the unconstitutional violation of private property ownership rights it would entail. The workforce housing problem is not the crisis that the media and the town councils pretend it to be. Nobody has the right to live in a cool, clean resort community like ours. Nobody should be compelled to pay for another person's perceived entitlement to that housing. And nobody should expect the government to control the normal supply and demand curve that creates the prices of our exclusive resort real estate. Real estate is the main driver of our local economy and an income feature is an integral part of the, of the incentive for most people to own most of Summit County real estate. Without that income feature, ski resort property ownership is unattainable and those purchases would be significantly reduced. The income feature is possible for owners to reduce their costs of ownership while at the same time providing the basic lodging need of vacationers who make our economy run. If we have no short-term units for vacationers to rent, those guests will no longer come to Summit County. They will find other resorts to satisfy their lodging need. With no guests coming here to vacation, no money will be spent on local businesses. Those businesses will become unprofitable and close and local workers will be laid off. The local economy will disappear just like it did 120 years ago. When the gold ran out, the mines closed down. Short-term rental income is, is crucial to Resort property ownership in the modern era and is like the precious metals of the previous boom economy. What if short-term rentals were outlawed and converted to long-term rentals? Could that government-induced coercion provide the income feature the property owners need? Not likely. Long-term rental rates would have to increase dramatically beyond the affordability range of local workers in order to provide property owners with an income stream equal to short-term rental income. In both cases, the local worker is out of luck and out of town by either being unemployed or priced out of the long-term rental market and is forced to return to Iowa to work in his father-in-law's hardware store. Economic, force, economic facts do not lie when you do the math. A government mandate to convert short-term rentals to long-term rentals is almost certain to be declared unconstitutional as a blatant violation of individual property ownership rights. Kim, that's the time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Ty Humphreys. Um, I just want to say I empathize with a lot of the comments that have come before, um, but I also want to share my perspective. I'm a local homeowner um, who can only survive here, can only pay my mortgage by using uh, a short-term rental. We rent one room out of our house, and that's what allows me to live here. Um, so it sounds like you guys, you know, you've, you've recognized that. Um, perspective. Um, and I just want to voice it. That's, that's where I'm at. If I can't have my one room short term rental, I've got to go. Thanks, Ty. Ty, thank you. I wasn't ready. <laughs> uh, good evening, council members. Um, I appreciate your patience with me. Uh, if I go over, it's been over 10 years since I've spoken in front of this council. Uh, as a teenager. My name is Kevin Kane. Many of you may know me, uh, though only one of you, hi Carol, worked for me this week at the Breck Epic. Um, I hope to see you all there volunteering next year. I graduated from Summit High School in 2009. Since then, I have received degrees from the University of Colorado and a master's degree in type design and book design from the Letterform Archive in San Francisco. I am currently serving as the director of book design at Stanford University. Also during this time, I have had uh, the honor of representing this town and this country as an Olympic level athlete on uh, the world stage. All of these experiences and credentials make me quite possibly the least qualified person in this room to speak about affordable housing in Breckenridge. However, as Mr. Mamula spoke about earlier, this is not about, not all about housing, and I completely agree. I would like to speak to you about something that is not on, uh, quite elegant as it is, your pie chart. Not housing, but unhousing. For the majority of the past 10 years, I have lived in uh, as different a place 
to Breckenridge as it is possible to live, in my opinion, and that is San Francisco, California. When I moved there to work for Stanford, I intentionally moved to the skid row of San Francisco, known officially as the Tenderloin. I will not, I will not uh, without becoming emotional, tell you about my beautiful and traumatic experience there, nor will I justify my love for the unhoused neighbors who I fed and attempted to save from an ongoing heroin epidemic that kills thousands a year. We here live in a bubble where, excuse me, can't read my own handwriting, <laughs> the tenuous line of quality of life, we have the luxury of considering whether my old friends, the elder children of this community can afford to live here with two to three jobs. This part of the world is deadly to us locals. We saw that in the Breck Epic this week, um, not literally, but it was quite close to being literal. It is a beautiful for its volatility. Can we take a moment to zoom out to 10,000 feet? Um, well, shit, I guess we gotta go higher since we're up here at 10,000 feet. Uh, to consider the ways that when we push those on the brink out of this expensive community into other expensive communities nearby, how we are indirectly and perhaps directly responsible for the growing and overwhelming unhoused communities in places like Denver, Colorado Springs, and yes, even San Francisco. Sir, I apologize, but we have to be consistent and hold everybody to three minutes. Fair enough. Thank That's you. it. Thank you. Kevin, do you have your comments written? Can you submit those to us or as an email to mayor at townofbreckenridge.com? Will do. Thank you. And if you'd like to come back to the next hearing, that'd be great too. I'll be here. Kevin, thank, thank you. you. Yes, sir. Everybody, my name is Terry Barbu. I own a number of restaurants in this town. And I don't know if this has been said before. I haven't been here for the whole meeting. But the only thing I could say is I would say out of the 200 employees I have, one half of them are only here for a year, year and a half. These people would be perfectly happy with some type of dormitory or some type of a setting where they can just have a place to dress their head for that year, you know? I don't know why everybody's saying, let's give it a short-term rental. What if we figure out a way to tax that short-term rental to do nothing more than to help build a 600 unit dormitory situation or multiple units where it's not for sale, it's for rent. It's controlled either by the, count, the town or by a private person that wants to take it on. But ultimately, all these guys do want to do is, is spend a season here, you know? And they're taking up, you know, housing, long-term housing, and they're going to be gone in a year or two anyways, you know? I don't know if that's ever been brought up. And the second thing is, for a short-term rental, what if you do two years on, two years off, you know? You just basically rotate it. So these people that bought these homes can spend those two years and they could rent it to the same thing what I'm saying, somebody that's only going to be here for a year or two, and then they move on, so... That's all I have to say. Just simple fixes. I know it's a lot more complicated than that. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Terry. Steven Gerard. I've been a resident here for six years. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but it fits into what I wanted to say because I came here thinking that this was going to be a community and I would have neighbors in a residential area. That's sorely not true. Uh, at this point in time, there are three hotels within 100 yards of my single family residence. I represent the Highlands Park POA. Every home constructed or sold within the past 12 months has been by or to a limited liability corporation. Nobody lives there except the 12 people who come and go every three to seven days. On my street, there are four full-time residents, each home with two to four people in them, and the three hotels, which swell the people in our neighborhood by 36 people. They aren't paying their fair share. Dr. Warner pointed that out. That's a systemic problem that the state of Colorado needs to resolve. They need to pay their fair share. There's no one fix for this, and my neighborhood is not gonna provide uh, long-term housing for employees. 
but it certainly is a quality of life issue for those of us who live here, work here, send our kids to school here, and made the choice to live in a neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Judge. Anyone else? Oh, I thought he was crawling over the seat to come to the mic. <laughs> Sir, Thomas. Um, Hi, Mark. I am uh, a realtor here for many years. Um, I think that uh, council, uh, I commend you for really identifying the problem of the degradation of this community. Um, I feel like we're just overrun with people. I see trash everywhere, more trash than I've ever seen in this town. And I know the town is trying to pick it up, but um, it's just characteristic, <clears throat> excuse me, characteristic of too many people. Um, I don't know what the answers are. I think that, um, you know, I would, I would caution the caps, although I think we're looking at creating caps that are greater than the actual numbers that we have today which I think is really important to establish something. As we see more redevelopment here and two bedroom homes being turned into eight bedroom homes and those being put on the rental pool, the rest of the uh, development of single family homes here and there in holdings, um, this problem is gonna get a lot worse. And I think that um, we keep talking about identifying the problem as being the licenses. But the problem is a demand for Breckenridge. The licenses are just allowing them, the rentals to come and stay. We need to be looking at marketing, uh, events. We should cease all marketing if you ask me at this point. Um, put it into housing fund. Um, and then uh, I, want, I just wanna say to John's point, um, uh, I agree, this is a bigger problem than just Breckenridge. This, at a minimum, has to be looked at on an upper blue basis. Um, <clears throat> if we implement caps here, then suddenly our buyers are going to be looking to Blue River. And Blue River is probably where we have more property that fits the long-term rental type property. We could actually be hurting ourselves if we don't get Blue River and the rest of the upper blue you know, in, in with us on this approach. Um, yeah, I mean, it could, it could haunt us really. Um, all of a sudden everybody's buying in Blue River now. So that's it. Thank you, Mark. Mark. Hi, my name is uh, Dave Levinson. And um, I swear I didn't give my notes to Mark. <laughs> So I kind of fall in the, in the middle on this, and I appreciate the effort you guys are going through. It's hard, um, and I'm empathetic with that process. Um, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit regards to the point that's already been made, an erosion of the culture of the town. And I think that uh, short-term rental is a component of it, but it's not the whole thing. And to Mark's point, you know, I don't know how many people here have been to Key West, but there's a street there called Duval Street, which is like their main street. And I feel like that's what's happened to Breckenridge. 365 days a year, locals don't walk up and down our sidewalks anymore. And it's because there's so much demand and there's been so much demographic change here. And I feel like we, in the big picture here, the 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 30,000 um, foot perspective is how do we reduce some of the tourism? I mean, are, are we at Disneyland or are we the town of Brackenridge? And um, so where I fall in the center on this is, you know, I, I believe in homeowner rights and I also believe in the quiet, quiet solitude of being able to have a home and, and not have that interrupted. Um, and so, Part of me feels like if you're going to impose a cap, maybe it's maybe it's a really big cap, 
or it's going to be, you know, an emphasis on, on trying to reduce the amount of people that are coming into our town. And also, maybe that looks like a reduction of uh, timeshare density. You know, we got, we've got, you know, multiple four people a night every single night of the week. And, um, you know, maybe it's an expansion of some of our open space to create, you know, or reallocation rather, where you're starting to build more workforce housing. Um, I, I don't feel, and this I'll be really brief here, I don't really believe that capping short-term rental is going to provide long-term rental. You've got to incentivize long-term rental. Um, if you don't incentivize it, those people that were investing here, their homes are going to be vacant. So then we become this town that's just filled with you know, empty homes and we haven't solved the problem yet. So I guess my last thing to say is, please look at this and I know you are, the bigger picture, how do you change the culture? Thanks, Levy. What else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Dustin McQuaid. Um, I suppose it's really, I don't know if this is open for questions, uh, less of a comment, but uh, I certainly understand, you know, someone who lives here full time certainly understand the quality of life issues. Someone else mentioned the trash. It's, you know, all my buddies make fun of me, you know, like I'm the guy that's always like, oh my God, there's so much trash this year. I get the quality of life thing. And I think it's important. That's why everyone moved here. But I'm curious, the what, what, how do people see the actual steps of a short-term rental cap converting? And again, I understand the quality of life side, but how does that exactly equate, like literally the steps to where you have more long-term rentals? And uh, I, I don't know if this is necessarily a question to be answered now, but it's uh, a question I sort of pose to you. Uh, been, you know, been in real estate, other places for quite a while, studied economics, and uh, I don't know, this has kind of become almost like a little bit of a, I don't want to say hobby, but I find it very interesting. And I just, I'm, I'm not quite sure how you go from less short-term rentals to more quote unquote workforce housing or long-term rentals. So let me, let me just briefly answer you. First mm -hmm. of all, we're not talking about less short-term rentals. We're stopping, you know, roughly in some, and this is yet to be decide, de decided, but it would be a cap to allow no more. Gotcha. Okay. Which would stop the degradation of some of these places that were traditionally long-term rental. And that's really the, I mean, if you want to just boil it down to one thing, that's the, that's the reason. Nobody that currently has a license would lose their license. And I, and for what so, worth, I don't have a license. Yeah. I'm just, you know, like just the way I think through the economics of it. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to sort of reconcile how it goes from one to the other. And that's really with everything else that we're doing. And we have multiple programs that we work on constantly when none of you are in the room that are everything from building housing. We've built over a thousand units in the last 10 years mm -hmm. and we've lost, you know, I mean, it's honestly, it's like trying to push sand underwater. It just does not really work. So if we, you know, can sort of stop the bleeding, then some of these other efforts we we do, um, you know, potentially we'll start to turn that tide. And that, that's the philosophy. So this so. is like one, uh, one arrow in the quiver. This is so just one part of a gotcha. much larger strategy. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, yeah. and I, I, I've got friends that, you know, the owner of the house that they were renting, uh, you know, sold it. And, you know, it's like, I don't know. I think that sometimes there gets to be this sort of attitude that, well, you know, that was a, a bad person that did that. But I mean, you know, it's been, all across the country. I mean, it's been a historic housing market. I mean, you know, you can't fault, you know, some guy that lived here, scratched everything together and, you know, sold a house. And, you know, it's unfortunate that he isn't going to rent it, but, you know, maybe he's living there full time. We, we do and, not think there are bad guys and good guys in this discussion. This yeah. is really not, yeah. and I know it gets framed like that, but that is not what this is. Okay. This is the town council trying to fix a problem that is spiraling out of control and if in five years we don't do anything and we're at 75 percent sure and, and anyway I'll, I'll reserve my comments for later but anyway yeah, that's but, the, it, but it's, that's one aspect, quick and dirty. it's one aspect it's one of aspect a, of a much larger okay gotcha okay technique all right if i could just if i may yeah. I, I feel like the messaging has gotten out where we're doing this for the long-term rental. And yes, of course, we're trying to increase long-term rentals in Breckenridge, but I think there's also other 
issues of just long-term residence, you know, being able to own a home year round, that sort of thing. I mean, and, and T speak, spoke to that, right? To how many locals have been putting in offers on houses just to, you know, not be able to compete with outsiders being able to short-term rent their home in order to make their money back. And so it's not, and, and I, I know that- And that's also not unique to some accounting for what it's right, worth, exactly. for what it's yeah, worth, no, it's you not. know. Yeah. Um, but I think, we, we want to do something about it, but it's just, sure. just to talk about that one snippet that I feel like is out there, that this effort is to increase long-term rentals, which hopefully that's, that's something that comes about it, but it's also for ownership too. And, you know, the, the trickle down effect, if somebody is able to buy into the Highlands and that opens up a home in the Wellington, which could open, you know, open up to somebody who's renting, you know, yeah. things like that. Again, actually, I, I mean, I guess that's sort of my thing, like, you know, it's, you know, from where I've been before, barrier entry is much lower. And I think that's the one thing that's really missing from Summit County. Like, you know, I don't know if that means there needs to be some sort of zoning change for a development or something, but somewhere where there can be solid, I, I don't know, starter homes, essentially. Like, there's none of that in Summit County. That's what we build. That way we try you know, to. One, anyway. okay. one thing we're doing that I don't know if it's just so many things we're doing, but one, we're buying, we're buying a condo. We're buying a condo, $400,000. Mm -hmm. We take off 20%. We sell it to somebody with a deed restriction. Yeah. We go to somebody, someone comes to us and say, oh, we just blew our boiler in our free market home. We need $30,000 for a boiler. And they can apply for housing help. We'll give them enough money to do that boiler or a certain amount of money to defray the cost. And then they agree to put it on a deed restriction. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do this all sorts of programs. You know, I'd, I'd really uh, ask you to talk to a, uh, a housing department this is just one so, so if there's an email like i mean i've been thinking about like i i yeah. you know well whatever i don't need to be up here and say it but like i got an idea you know some ideas you right, know, yeah, the email is mayor at town of send okay. us whatever you got okay thank perfect you. all right thanks guys thanks. hey let's lay we'll okay. have our comments shortly right. erica uh, anyone else yeah i need to make a comment to all the people that are watching on the virtual platform uh, I think there are many individuals that have tried to raise their hand and want to make uh, comments over the virtual platform, but the town council does not take uh, comments, questions over the platform is merely for you to have an opportunity to observe. If you have uh, questions or comments, you need to write those in an email to mayor at town of Breckenridge.com. Or you can show up at the next meeting. Or show up if you want to make comment in person. Right. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Just a, Tom Muldoon. Hey, Tom. Um, hey, uh, just a question. So, you know, you, you're using the, the date of 2010 of the year. So since then, how many more timeshare units are allowed here? I'd just like to know that number. We track those separately. So. Anyway, it's just a good yeah. number to know because it seems that it's changed since all the timeshare. <laughs> That's just what I saw in the last 20 years. So anyway, just my thought. Tom, thank you. Anyone else? Going once? Uh. Hi, my name is RJ Half. Thanks for uh, taking the questions, guys, or comments. Um, so I'm, um, you know, heard a lot of concerns here and you guys mentioned as well that there's sort of multiple, multiple problems, the short term rent or the long term renting um, or affordable housing for for labor, as well as um, the community feel. feel. Um, and so I'd like to ask because it seems like the, the solution here, like we have, we have very different concerns, and we have one solution. So what is what are we going to measure once we implement this, right? Like, what is the goal? Are we trying to have more affordable housing? Are we trying to have less tourism period? Um, um, you know, the housing stock is a percentage SCR versus work housing. Uh, manipulating that, that part pie chart, is, is that the goal? Like, wh what is the, will you guys be measuring things once you implement this policy? And what will be the long-term goal of this program? You know, right now, the, the reason for this program, like I said to Dustin, was because things are just out of, I think things are out of balance at the moment. 
you know, if you look at this, um, this sheet has, you know, virtually every town around us, including some huge towns. There is no town of sort of our of our tourism, you know, magnitude that has anywhere near the amount of short term rentals that we have. As Not even close. Percentage of the total housing stock. I mean, and I mean, even just you know. Dillon has 160 units. Frisco has 250 units. I mean, our, our issue with this is a magnitude issue. It, we are exponentially bigger than everybody. And we are even, we have more short-term rentals than Denver. So that is a massive amount that, you know, it's just one problem. This is just one thing we're trying to do to stop some of the bleeding right now. There will be more to this than just this cap. You know, we have We've had discussions in the community and with others about, you know, potential workarounds for people that offer housing or blah, blah. You know, there's more to it than this. This is step one, plus everything else that we've been doing for years. So, but yeah, but yeah. to make the, make more housing for, for locals or we, we to do. reduce and we do, tourism? Well, no, I mean, the reducing tourism thing, I... Listen, there, there's also, this is a much longer conversation. You know, I can talk to you about this off, offline. This, there's so many pieces to this puzzle. This is just one piece for us, trying to resolve some issues that are going on in the community that we hear from multiple people. And a lot of those people have showed up today. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, final comment. If, if we are going to implement something like this, it would be great if we had something the community could follow to see the success of it. So, you know, name a metric. Do we want the number the of locals stuff? living here? I mean, the destination I mean, management plan did this. The community asked for us to have 35% of workers living in the community. And we've already, and in 2018, it was already reduced to 29%, which means over the last three years, there has been a de decrease. We just don't know exactly how much. So, I mean, I think that most of us would agree that would be a great metric. Okay. to have that number of people living in our community again. And I think if you ask each one of us, I think our goals are probably a little bit different. Um, I, I would say we are measuring it. I think if you look at that pie chart of the Breckenridge housing units, I think that's the measurement. And I, like, I know my goal is to change the complexion of that pie chart. You know, so I, I do think that we are measuring it. I think we would continue to do so. Yeah, it'd be great to get updates on the measurement of that. We look at a tremendous sure, meeting. Yeah. It's good to yeah. see you. Without the mask, hopefully next time we can be all healthier. So, but you still look good as you are. So, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Patrick Murphy. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for their comments so far and thank you for the council for uh, hearing them. Uh, I'm a recent addition to the community. Um, and the reason why I was able to move here was because of the Housing Helps program. Um, the landlords that I have now um, deed restricted the house. Um, and me and three other um, employees in the town of Breckenridge were able to, to move here. And uh, I have the intention to stay here. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of agree with the comment that um, these residential properties are being used as commercial ventures. Um, someone is profiting off of them and sort of uh, I know that the, the tax code is a, an insanely complex thing and it's not uh, an issue that this room can really deal with, but uh, in order to uh, <clears throat> you know, to support the, the ventures that the town has done, like the housing helps and uh, the deed restricted things, you know, some more revenue from those streams um, and really making those people who are who are profiting off of this town and off of those uh, residential properties or commercial entities um, pay their fair share. Um, and that's, that's about it. Um, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate Thanks, it. Patrick. Anyone else going? Yes, sir. I guess I'll probably interject a little humor into let's have a name first. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Wait, what's, what's your name? What's, what's your name? Oh, my name is Scott Tupper. I mean, we know it, but yeah. not everybody. For the record, Scott. yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that trouble me about what's going on up here, but the one thing that I haven't really noticed so far today is that the onus of people that 
aren't behaving themselves, the onus in trying to control them or, or manage them seems to fall on the people that live in these neighborhoods that are kind of being overrun. And just three examples. I think it was a year ago, I was driving home through Blue River and there was a trash can out in front of this short-term rental place and the critters had gotten into it and it was trash was spread all over the place. So I called the, the, um, the tunnel trash number that you called you know, to make a complaint. And <clears throat> it ended up that the Blue River Marshal had to go up and clean all the trash up. And he called me up and I felt horrible that the, the responsibility of cleaning up after the short-termers fell onto this guy, the town marshal from Blue River. And that just doesn't seem to me to be right. And the more humorous anecdotes that I wanted to, to mention is that I used to have a job that I had to get up really early in the morning. So I'd go to bed early. And one of these incidents, a Ford Expedition got stuck in my driveway and three ladies walked up to my front door, knocked on my door and they had high heel shoes on. This is the middle of winter and asked me to help them out. And I said, okay, I really should be in bed, but I'll help you guys out. I walked out there in a, like I said, a Ford Expedition. It's got four different tires, none of which are snow tires. It's not four wheel drive. The guy is terrified. The one guy that was with their group was terrified to try to get out of my driveway. And in the meantime, the three gals asked to use my bathroom. <laughs> so being the accommodating, really nice guy that I am, I of course let him in to use my bathroom. And then I backed their truck their expedition out so that they could um, could get out. And I pointed them in the right direction. I said, I don't think you're on the right street, but you know, Google it, call the, the management company, something, and I got to go to bed. And then the, the one that was that had probably the most benefit for me was there was about 10 gals that were here for a bachelorette party. And they also got stuck in my driveway. Excuse me. Why? Well, that's very entertaining. Your time is up. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to wait to hear the next story. Five minutes is up. Ah, okay. Yeah, you'll have to catch that on another. Thanks. <laughs> now I want to know what the hell happened. Yeah, I know. It. I know. Tell counsel with the rest of the story. I wonder if they're still in this house. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Come on down. Hi. Hi. My name's Betsy Ross Krieg, and I'd like to support what the gentleman before me just mentioned. Um, he said that he felt so bad because the Brecon, the uh, Blue River Marshal had to come and pick up trash. I feel bad because every time I call the rental number, or the non-emergency um, police number, these gentlemen and ladies that are supposed to be here to support us, help us and keep us safe are out there trying to control people that should have had lessons in courtesy when they were six. And so quickly, the uh, I'd like to support, I guess, Rick. I'd like to support what Rick said, and that is, um, I understand caps and everything, but about an hour ago, you said there are, there are things that someone was talking about, thinking about, and that was limiting the amount of rental homes or rentals in a residential neighborhood on a block. I have five homes in my little cul-de-sac, two are rentals. Not, no one comes, no one lives there. The rent, the owners don't live there. And next door is a house of 7,000 square feet, sleeps 18, 17 women were there about two weeks ago. And it was like a sorority party. And our kind police force came 
and shut them up at midnight. They shouldn't be asked to do that. So I support limiting the amount of rentals on a block, in a neighborhood, whatever you can do. I know there are bigger issues that you guys just heard about today, but keeping the character of the neighborhood in Breckenridge that we came to, I hope you'll consider that too. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. There's a lot of women, call Tefa, they're his specialty, okay? <laughs> 17 yoga instructors for you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it wear them all out. All right, anyone else? Going once, going twice. The end of public comment. Thank you all for your engaging and thoughtful comments. Yeah, all of them, thank you. All right, council, what is your pleasure? Let's start, Dick. Do you want to start? Did I see your hand go up there? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start. I, you know, the one thing I was going to say earlier is what is unique to Breckenridge with this issue is we have so many more short-term rental licenses to our our local residents. I mean, we're we're up there with major resorts when you look at the Airbnb data and how many short-term rentals. There is not another community in this state that has as many short-term rental licenses as we do. And, um, and that's, that makes this, this problem uniquely um, more challenging. So um, I appreciate everyone's that. comments. I appreciate everyone coming. I appreciate the constructive nature of all the comments. Um, you know, I, I feel like the time is now. I, I don't feel like we, we have any choice now but to, to, to establish a cap on the short-term rental licenses. And for discussion's um, sake, you asked me to go first. Um, I believe we're at 24... 95. 95 right now. I would propose that we cap them at 2550. And um, there, there is a chance that if, if we all agreed to that, that by November 1st, when the ordinance would go into effect or November 2nd, whatever we decided, that we could be over that because I'm assuming people will rush to get licenses. And, and to me, that's okay. You know, we, we can't control it until the ordinance goes into effect. But at that point, I think we need to let natural attrition get us back down to 2550, meaning that we wouldn't issue any more licenses until any that went over that number extinguish to um, that, that number. I, I think we keep the ordinance very simple with just a cap to get started. I have a lot of ideas for incentives going down the road to, to uh, try to help people that, that were gonna try to get licenses over that number. And I think we can create incentive um, programs to 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 allow some of that uh, i look forward to those discussions down the road but i think those need to be in the form of amendments to this ordinance after the fact i i just i feel the urgency of getting this done and i think those incentive programs we really need to vet we need to do our best to anticipate the uh um, unintended consequences which trust me on this cap issue, we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to understand the unintended consequences. Um, we, we do look at data. I'm on the housing committee. We look at data at every single meeting. Um, there are a lot of um, data points that we're trying to achieve and um, maybe we need to be more public in communicating those. Um, so those are my comments and- uh, For clarification, uh, you're talking about non-exempt properties. I am talking about non-exempt properties. Thanks, Rick. Eric, uh, yes. if I may, as people are making comments, one other key, uh, key factor that we need to address is that, uh, that those individuals who currently have a license would be allowed to keep that license as long as they remain as the owner of that property. And so once that property sells, I believe the council's desire, and I need to make sure we have uh, 
agreement on. And once the property sells, the, that license does not go with the property. That is correct for how I feel this this ordinance should be written. That that license is extinguished upon the sale of the of the property. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I think one of our, the issues we're gonna have to look at is, is the LLC issue. You know, if a property's owned as an LLC and they, they sell um, the, the ownership of the LLC, but the LLC continues to own the piece of property, we're gonna have to address that, but that can be done in amendment because that's a little more complicated issue that we need to address. Um, so yes, I think that they should be extinguished upon sale. So any existing licenses, they need to be renewed every year. They would have the right to renew every year. So as long until, as that current owner remains the owner. That is correct. Yeah. So we're not, we're not doing a takings. We're not going backwards and trying to extinguish any units. We're, we're allowing renewals. Now, full disclosure, we are working on um, increasing fees for those renewals. Um, we're working with a consultant right now. The state state law requires that when you implement a fee, that the monies generated from the fees must be used 100% to mitigate the impacts of of the um, of what you're placing the fee on. So we're working with a consultant to understand exactly how much um, those fees should be and be justified. Um, to, to the um, community and, and to comply with the law. So, um, so I, I do anticipate the fees will go up. Thank you. Yep. Dick, uh, Dennis. Dick, I like the way that you said it early on is that every decision we need, make now is to fiercely protect the fabric of our community. And I think that is my overall goal. Um, I definitely agree with everything Dick said. I do want, I do not want the um, the cap to run with the property to your uh, comment. The license, you mean? The license, thank you. Um, and I wanna go back to what Dr. Warner said. I do like the idea right now of capping. And I think that possibly our end goal needs to be to, be, to reduce the number, but I think we have to look at that and see where the matrix come in. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about all I've got. The, what's the number on the cap that you would? Oh, I'm sorry. Dick wanted 2550, and I looked at this, and I think uh, 2550 would be acceptable at the current time. Really? No. Okay. Uh, um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming and speaking, and um, it's just really wonderful to see everyone here in our community come out and speak. Um, so again, with our values, Carol mentioned them earlier, um, it's hometown feel and authentic character was one of our values and the BTO really did a, a really great job reaching out to our community and, and finding the values that we wanna focus on. And I really think that's important today and something to think about. I think today we've also seen that our community currently is hurting. So I do worry about the current number of STRs um, I know that we've been called um, a short-term rental community, and I just disagree with that. I don't think we are. I think we're a community, you know, with, with different assets and different faces to that. And I think the people really make our community what it is. And with that in mind, I think when we look at that pie chart, it does look like short-term rentals first and other types of units, you know, second. Um, including our residential units. And I just think that's, again, out of balance. Um, I do think if we don't put on a cap, I think short-term rentals will only have deed restricted and short-term rentals in our community. I don't think that's okay. I would like to go lower. Um, ideally, I would say 1500. Um, I understand that that's probably not going to happen tonight or today. Um, but yeah, that's that's the number I would like to see. Now, I, I agree with Dick as far as, you know, we have a certain amount of short-term rentals. I don't think that we can, I don't think it's right to take it away. What I would think, what I would say is just the natural attrition, what we're talking about, where when a property is sold, um, 
then the next property doesn't necessarily get a short term rental license. But that would be if I, and I understand 1500 your number that I understand that there could be compromises, but yeah. I'll just put 1500 out there. Carol. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Wait, no, I'm sorry. There was one other thing. Um, I would like an exemption for full time residents. So it's 1500 plus full time resident exemption. So like that gentleman who is here who is renting out a room in his house. And you could judge that by if you're a voter in Breckenridge. So we want to fifth, sorry. maybe come back and talk about that in a okay. second iteration. Okay. So we don't confuse this issue. Okay. If you're okay with that. Yeah. Carol. Um, it was really helpful to hear all the comments. I think before anything, we keep talking about how we're a community first. And I think that is a unique quality to Breckenridge and our compared to our peer communities like Vale, Copper, Keystone. A lot of us chose Breck because we are a community first. And hearing some of the comments, some of the issues with. Uh, okay. with Look right at that thing. Okay, got it. <laughs> Um, one of the issues is just the that we're hearing from the community is the nature of living next to a business. You know, these short term rentals, they're small businesses within our community. You're not li living next to a neighbor, you know. Um, and I think that we are oversaturated right now and it is deteriorating our neighborhood feel. Um, at the same time, some of us touched on a quality issue. Um, the quality issue is apparent. I think the quality, the brand, the visitor experience is starting to suffer because we're losing that community feel, which is in part due to short-term rentals impacting our neighborhoods and also displacing our workers. Um, so I am in favor of a cap. I'll get to the number in a second. I think there should be caveats and I know we'll discuss them later. And of course, just to get it out there, we're working on a lot of other strategies, incentivizing long-term rentals, building, buy-downs. There's a lot being done, but ultimately I think we need to have an upper limit for short-term rentals. Um, so with that, um, I would negotiate. I definitely split the difference between Eric and Dick and Dennis, somewhere around 2000, which is where we were about five years ago. I just cannot make this easy, can you? <laughs> um, I think everyone up here has really said everything exactly what our community needs to hear. I mean, for a long time, we've been discussing this. The destination management plan has been, ha did lots and lots of, got lots and lots of community input. And we have heard from our community that we need to ensure that there's a harmony between quality of life, sense of place. That means that our brand depends on what kind of community this is. And there's every reason to stick up for that. And that's why you all are here. And I'm very proud of my fellow council members up here. Um, I really want to get that, um, like I told the gentleman at the lecture, and I really want to improve on get back up to that 35% of um, workers of workers living in our community. I don't believe that we're anywhere near 28%. I believe that's the or 29%. That's the 2018 number and I there has been a massive change over the last 3 years. So I don't believe um, that that's where we are right now and I'm very interested in getting that number. I'm not sure if that's something that we can figure out or how we can get to that number. Um, I, I love that Erin is putting out a bold number and I would certainly consider that. Um, in my mind, I really talked to a lot of people, said, you know, when was the community comfortable for you? When did you have enough employees? When did you feel like we had a strong year round economy that we really need to have to keep these employees you know, with a paycheck every month. And I, um, I have heard over and over two to three years ago. So I, because we've been adding about a hundred a year, I was looking at 2,200 um, for the number, just also to give Eric a headache. But, um, <laughs> and what are the other questions? 
the license. You don't want it. It doesn't obvious. go with the property. That's right? obvious. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to pile on too much. Um, everyone said much of what uh, I wholeheartedly believe in as far as uh, the love of the community, the appreciation of people that showed up on either side. Um, I think to, sh to shoot the snake closest to our foot, I'd say I I'd say no more. Cap it as it is right now, who's not being, who, who is, isn't in the books to applying for a license. And then with the intention of getting it down to 2000 or 1500 or whatever, but not, a, not to come, not to uh, participate in a takings, but through attrition, get the number down. Um, and, and again, I, I just, I worry that we have diminished the product of Breckenridge. I, I think, you know, why people come here, it's, it's not necessarily, we don't have the best skiing, our town isn't as pretty as Telluride. Uh, it's not as funky as Crested Butte. No, the community, you look at Telluride, the mountains, it's a, it's a whole different thing. People come here for the, for the people that live here. It's, they don't come here for the architecture. They don't come here necessarily for the, for the skiing per se. We have great skiing, great backcountry skiing. They come here for the people that are in this room. And as soon as we diminish the people in this room, make them feel unvested, make them feel that they're just a vessel for economics opposed to an integral part of the community, then that's when our product is gonna suffer and it has suffered and it will continue to suffer. So what I'm saying is people come here because of, of the locals and the locals are getting the short end of the stick. They're not putting out a good product because they're overworked. The restaurants are not putting out, the business is not putting out a good product because they're understaffed. And, and that's what this, the first thing to do is cap it. And then with all these other programs, I think what we can do is make a, I say, substantial difference in how things go years down the road. But first, cap it right, right now, as far as I'm concerned, and then we'll deal with it. And then again, like Dick was saying, like, like everyone was saying, yeah, if you live in your home, I think we have to kind of figure that out as far as, uh, you know, making that an easier fix. But that's up to staff to do, come back to us with a realistic proposal and I'll definitely support it, but I'll say cap it now and hopefully get to two grand to 1500. But if you were to choose a number. <laughs> cap it right now, whatever the no, number is right now. You can't, what's, though, you what's, can't what's because the, we don't know what that number what's is. What's the goal and, number? We know it is. What's your goal? Goal number? 495 today. Yeah, so but no. You can't, you can't because you can't. people can buy them for the next 60 days. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we can't. Obviously, we can't do that. Very but once, attrition. once just call well, it whatever. Yeah, so there's a, in the next so thirty-five your sixth days. Sixth number for the evening. Yeah, the next thirty-five days. <laughs> you know, what happens if someone goes over five uh, twenty-five fifty in the next thirty? But they days? will. It doesn't matter. They it will. It, it will. It will. It'll be attrition the same way. Um, if you decide two thousand is the number, it may take you three years to get there, but nobody will get a new license current owners can continue to keep it but nobody would get a new license until you go under 2000 and that could take three years to get there or five years or five years. don't we have to pick a number to cap it right now we do yeah, yeah. but I, you can pick whatever number you want what's your end game? I'd, 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 I'd say four if you'd like i'd, I'd say I'd, I'd say 2000 with a goal of with a goal of 1500. Well, then is it 2000 or 1500? <laughs> 1500. Just say 1500. No, with this. this is what every meeting is like, just so you know. For those of you who never come to these things. He's saying 1500. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here today. I, I know how difficult it is to stand up in, in front of your, your friends and your peers. And you know that every time you say something, somebody in this room is pissed off because of what you're saying. And that's, you know, that makes it difficult. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart, number one, for showing up and saying what you believe. And number two, for doing it in a civil way and uh, nobody booed. We've had meetings like that and they're terrible. And that's not what this community is about. So thank you all truly for um, acting like responsible humans that live in a tight knit community like we do. The thing that always resonates in my mind, and honestly, a lot of times um, during every meeting we have, whether it is McCormick selling the Epic to Iron Man or you know, building a parking structure, the number one thing on the Town of Breck vision plan 
that was done by the community, not by the council, but by the community in 2002 is community character. And that's where I feel that we have slipped lately. You know, I'd like to blame the pandemic because we all lost our way a little bit, but honestly, there are things that I think we should have done before that um, to, to write this ship that we really did see going this way. And our, at the time, our solution was, let's just keep building housing. That's always been our solution. Let's just keep building housing. But you know, we're gonna, we still haven't built the 80 units that we've been working on for over a year, and we lose 80 units every year out of the long-term rental pool for whatever reason. Short-term rental, second homeowner buys it, they're just going to use it for whatever that reason is. We have been we have been pushing a rock uphill that we cannot get to where it needs to go. So this is just one one piece. This is just one thing we're going to do to to try to get our community back where it belongs. Listen, there's a reason people like to come and visit here. But if this thing spins too wildly out of control, they're not going to want to come. To, to your short-term rental because the good restaurants are closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. And the dude in a retail store is in such a terrible mood because he's worked 40 straight days. I mean, that is happening right now to the, like Jeffrey says, to the diminishment of what we provide as a product. And I know some of you don't like that, you know, we're just a town, but we are a town that creates a product for our guests. And that product is not what it used to be. Unfortunately, through nobody's fault, really, that's just where we happen to be right now. And, and as your town council, we need to try to correct that. So as one part of this, I agree that we need a cap. I, I'm okay with any of these numbers you guys have thrown out. I mean, I, let, let me throw out a seventh number and then we'll really have an argument about it. But um, I do, whatever we do today, there's a couple other things that you, everybody needs to understand. Um, Betsy, we are working on compliance. That this new fee structure we're working on, I don't, I don't know where she went. Oh, there you are. This new fee structure we're working on, it, we're gonna need that to beef up our compliance so that your neighbors aren't picking up trash. I know I pick up trash in my neighborhood, you know, and I know there's cars parked. And sometimes I just don't feel like calling the hotline because you know what? I'm sick and tired of it. So I call, I call the guy that owns the house and then they correct it, but you know, Every three days, you have to retrain people to come to the neighborhood. So we need to fix our compliance. So it's not up to you to do that. So that, that's something we are definitely working on. And the Nexus study will sort of give us an idea of what, what that kind of thing is going to cost. Um, Ty, who has a room in his house, we need to come back after we set this cap and go through this 60-day period um, to talk about some exemptions. Yeah. And... The reason we're not doing it today is that's another like 12 hour discussion just with the seven of us. What, what's that next phase? Is it if somebody lives in their home 300 days out of the year, they can rent it for 65 days a year? I don't, maybe. Maybe you should always get one if you just rent your room out. And that's not the same thing. So um, I, we have a lot of other things to talk about after this next, this after phase number one. Um, I do believe that the license does not go with the property for the very simple reason that that license has no intrinsic value. And if it goes with the property, nobody else ever gets a license. It stays with that property. It creates a value to that license. And one home that has a license and an exact same home next to it, they sell for different amounts and they have different amount of people looking for those property said, and that's just unfair. So the license goes away and we need to resolve that LLC thing, Dick. I, I totally agree with you. Um, when I was a kid, my, my dad had a restaurant in Pennsylvania. And at the time there was, a, there was a max number of liquor licenses. You could sell your liquor license on your restaurant for $150,000. And this was in 1979. And that's what we create if the, if the license becomes bonded to that property or that person. So it'll just be a list. There'll be a list and the first person in line gets the next license. And that's, it's more fair than a lottery. The lottery tends to, you know, yeah, that's just a lock and we're not, we don't like that. Um, you know, just as an aside, Tom, the timeshare thing is not something we don't talk about all the time. And there is another project. And I'd like all of you that feel like Tom to show up for the next project also. Maybe I could go 
to your restaurant and get a beer. Now I can't. Brian, it's, I can't. What do you mean? Um, there's not enough people to pour it. Um, so I, um, ju just to re reiterate, this, is, this really is about community character for us. It started as a housing crisis, and it still is. But the majority of this is about our community and seeing you people when I go out for a cup of coffee or I go to Rootstock for dinner and being able to see people that you know, not just people that happen to love our town. That's great. I'm glad they're here. I thank God every day that these people come to our community, but they're, you know, I'd rather see you guys, honestly. Don't make that a headline. That'll nobody will come to my restaurant. <laughs> so um, the thing we have to resolve right now is is the number. We have 2550, 2,500, 2200, and 2495. <laughs> 2200. Done. I could go 2200. I'll go 22. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I'll go with 22. <laughs> 22 works. Okay, that's the majority. All right. People to know that whatever the number is set, we have to see what the dynamics will be with a new fee system, what will drop out. We know that recently a lot of people have gotten licenses because they're, they don't even know if they're going to rent, but they want one just in case. Some of those people are going to drop out of this when they have to pay more in a fee. And the council can adjust that number in the future once they understand what it feels like what's happening. And remember, you still have, uh, so in two, three weeks from today, we will have our first reading of uh, legislation that the staff will craft for us. It will be two weeks and then a final, and in, in both of those, um, the first reading and second reading, we will take public comment. It will be at night. So it'll be at the seven o'clock meeting. So any of you wanna come either in support or against, please do, we'll do the same thing we did today with the same, um, the same civil discourse and once again thank you all for being here i'll come up and see you left we're going to take a five minute break i'm thinking
another meeting. Hey, Trucky, can we call it neighborhood preservation? In the audience, we're about to do a reading for uh, executive session, so we need to do that. Do we have language? Give me a minute. Okay. Once we go to exec session, then everybody has to leave the room too, unless you're. Didn't I tell you this? I forgot. Shannon. And we'll see how many people throw bombs now at us, but that's okay. That's what we do. So this is the Are we on mute? Are we on mute? I don't think so at the moment, but we will be once we go to exact session. Hi, Ann. We have an Ann exec session. Those are awesome. Oh yeah, a little bit of oh. a little bit of everything. Like when Ann comes, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm excited. It's a nice bag. Thanks. Uh, once we go to exact session too, we can. Can we? Yeah. More yeah. urban. Yeah. We're all vaccinated. You're still on camera right now, right? I can change that. What you guys make a motion? I can change that. I move to move into exact no, session. Not make the motion until we have the recording on. And by and also Carol's going to make yeah. a motion because it has to be. Yeah, it has to have. She, she returns my calls. Helen, Helen, you want me to start the recording here? Oh, yes, sorry. I just gotta, I gotta do all this and turn this up too. You want to go into um, do the the roll call first, through, and then I'll turn this off. We're gonna do the motion now, and then we'll do the roll call. Go ahead, Carol, please. I move that town council go into executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Paragraph 4E of section 246402 CRS relating to determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations developing strategies for negotiations and instructing negotiators. And paragraph 4F of section 246402 CRS relating to personnel matters. Second. A motion has been made for the town council to go into an executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase acquisition, lease transfer or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Paragraph 4E of section 246402 CRS, relating to determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategies for negotiations and instructing negotiators. And paragraph 4F, section 246402 CRS, relating to personnel matters. Subjects of the executive session include, A, land the town council may have an interest in purchasing, and B, a confidential discussion of issues concerning the proposed employment contract of the person selected to be the new town attorney. Roll call, please. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yellow. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Coon. Yes. Yes.
from that and then head over to the yeah. retirement event. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll probably Zoom mm -hmm. that. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Move by proxy. You can't go by proxy. No. Well, will the special meeting be do virtually? Yeah, the rule allows it. 3 p.m. I won't be virtual either. Oh, no. You can't, you can't give your proxy to right. Dick. Uh, yeah. Okay. Would you would you vote no in the grays? No, I would vote yes. But I can't yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious. So I went to uh, Dick and I were at the uh, and Rick was there for a while. Todd Perkins Memorial. Yeah. Which was really pretty amazing. I burned my head. Oh, I know. Because it was way longer than it's four hours. Were you there? Yeah. Michael Bunchman <laughs> was unbelievable. And I didn't wear a hat out of respect, not thinking it was going to be a three and a half hour event. Man, he oh, was, my gosh. Started with his sister was fantastic. And then, you know, everybody in between. But the two of them were just. Did Leslie talk also? She was good. <clears throat> yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then they all came over to the restaurant afterwards and took up a whole section for the pretty much the rest of the night and made Terry pay for it, which was great. Terry <laughs> <laughs> whipped out his credit card a couple of times. It was pretty, it was just so nice to see them. And yeah. at one point, Therese got sad and just left. She just couldn't. Uh, she couldn't take it anymore. I just feel so bad. People yeah. 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 Uh -huh. It was quite a community uh, gathering. Third. Unfortunately, another sad reason, but it right. was a nice gathering. No, there was a really fun one the other night, which was mm -hmm. Kevin Ahern's retirement party. Yeah, was wow. Were there some old timers at that thing? His replacement, huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah no kidding. The busiest they guy in some county. Local. Who was it? Who's the Frisco. <laughs> well, Will got this yeah, shit a little bit. Right. Follow the calendar tomorrow at 11. Probably. I might leave right after. Special meeting at 3 o'clock next week. Oh, yeah, I need to put that in. It's two weeks. No, next week. Next Tuesday. What's that about? That's for the attorney. The attorney. Oh, we, need, we need to. Adopt a resolution yes. to. Here's at three o'clock, Kelly. Yeah, we'll do it here. Sorry. Right here, right? Just three o'clock here, and then from there, we'll go over to the retirement thing. <clears throat> so get your stories about Wendy and Gary ready. Oh, In particular, baby. Gary. I tell about time some steel loans. Uh -huh. Tell Gary how much money is in the open space budget. <laughs> <laughs> all upset about it. Oh. Man, he was, he was, he's missed. Yeah. He's a good dude. He's, yeah, he still, still is. Right? You know, after our, uh, <laughs> after our um, mayor's talk at the, or the council talk at the golf course, I got a uh, message from Dan Corwin and a message from Tate Pringle about what a good job the pro is doing. Oh, good. And don't listen to those guys. They're all just whining. <laughs> It's pretty tremendous. Yeah, both of them. So, on the BCA update. Oh, virtual. Yeah, no. Let me. Um... said she was doing it. Yeah. Hold on. I'm going to call the Breckenridge Town Council regular meeting to order. It is August 24th at 7 p.m. Roll call, please. Mr. Carlton. Here. Mr. Bergeron. Here. Ms. Owens. Here. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Giello. Here. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have approval of the minutes for August 10th and August 18th. Any changes, corrections, deletions, additions? I had one change I think yes. I thought. It was about the call up. And I think it quoted you saying that the planning commission works within the building code. And I think it should be development code. Very good. Oh, that's a yeah, good I catch. Nice I, job. I said that too. I didn't want to say anything. Though. You didn't want to call me out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. With that change, anything else? Uh, with that one change, the meetings for minutes for August 10th and 18th stand approved. Approval of the agenda. Rick, any change? Yes. 
uh, under new business, I believe, we'll be adding a emergency ordinance tonight. Um, Excellent. The title of which is. Uh, I'll, I'll read it into the record. Thank you. <laughs> it's a long one. Pretty long. Do you have the bill number on it? Uh, 25. All right. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Uh, communications to council. These are citizens' comments, non agenda items only. Three minute time limit. I got one guy in front of you, um, Larry, and then you can get up behind him. Yes, sir. Uh, please state your name for the record and then go to it. My name is Josh Epperson. Um, thank you all for taking public comment on this. We've been listening online um, from, the, um, from the condo there uh, for quite some time and listened to the pros and cons and what everybody had to say about the short-term rentals. This is specifically to this, uh, to that point. Um, as a condo owner here since 2004, when we bought here, we bought here specifically for the location, obviously the community, uh, and also the investment, because the intent was for it to grow, uh, and it has. Um, although pleased that we will be able to keep our license, uh, we are concerned that the high density housing, uh, specifically up the four, doc, the four o'clock corridor, peak eight, peak nine, everywhere where there's high density housing, why are they not exempt? And that being, this is based on the assumption that your exempt will have transferability of their license. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. I know that all the details have not come out. But if you look at all of those units that are up and down, the high density units, they're not in a neighborhood. And they were built specifically for that point, for the skiers and the tourists. So when you think about that, you know, when, when you're looking at this, and I know you're trying to be fair by, you know, spreading it out over all the different communities, whether they be neighborhoods and housing, I get it out there. Uh, but when you're looking at the core of Breckenridge, right in the center of Breckenridge, uh, we live right across from Riverwalk Center. When you look at that area and all the high density housing all the way up to the ski mountain, those are all built for purpose. That's what Breckenridge was built on as those units housing those tourists because you're not building any more hotels. Um, should a owner choose to sell, and this is just for your consideration, but should a owner choose to sell their condo, you all get to make that decision whose value, whose property value goes up and down. If you are exempt and it is transferable, your property value goes up, but if the license is not transferable, it goes down. It's picking winners and losers. Um, in addition to that, you may be even creating a business monopoly is the hotels and the timeshares, which will be exempt because of the front desk or, or whatever that means, um, get to, you know, when, when they have that ability to set prices, you're also diminishing the fabric of, of family and affordability here in Breckenridge because if they have an exclusive or a monopoly on it. This may be five or 10 years down the road. Those prices are gonna go up very, very high and there's nowhere else to put them. Uh, your decision uh, not to exempt the high density in town locations creates that monopoly. And also, I want you to consider this. What we are asking you to do, or at least consider, is that we are asking you to exempt the high density housing and the transferability of those rental licenses to the areas that are designed for that purpose for the tourists and the skiers. Thank you. Um, and don't forget, we'll be revisiting this in three weeks. So if you could come back in three weeks also, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Mr. Chris Bell. For the record, Larry Chris Bell, 100 Lincoln Place. Thanks for the opportunity to address the council. Appreciate that. So uh, unfortunately I was unable to come and attend the work session today, but I do have an interest in your discussion of short-term housing caps. And I'd like to speak out today in favor of short-term rental caps. Full disclosure, I have a short-term rental. I have a great management company. My short-term is right next door to me and I'm fully aware of everything that goes on over there. My great neighbors who are longtime local residents on three sides of, of this house have my phone number and I want to retain their friendship. So unfortunately, that's the crux of the problem in other areas in our community. They cannot 
claim those kind of connections to their short-term rentals. And therein is the problem that you're dealing with, is that there's a disconnect between the behavior that happens at short-term rentals and who is there to be accountable for it. So I think that for the long-term preservation of this community, you guys are going in a great direction in talking about capping short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Anyone else? Mr. Doctor, Mr. Doctor, Dr. Warner. <laughs> John Warner for the record, uh, 15 Linden Lane. Is that what you're supposed to do, Larry? Sure. Um, thank you again for this afternoon. Uh, I thought it was a very productive uh, work session. I thought all your comments were terrific. Uh, I like the direction that you're headed. Uh, and I'm very happy that you had such a civil, well-run meeting. Uh, Eric, you teed it up beautifully. Um, but I'm here to thank you <laughs> for something else. I'm here to thank you for your wonderful gift to Building Hope, $10,000, uh, as a memorial to Todd Perkins. We were just talking earlier about the memorial, very sad, but it does show the depth and breadth of this community. Uh, Eric was there, Dick was there, Jeffrey was there, I was there, and uh, it was terrific. And you as a council were prescient in your uh, donation. Uh, Tim Casey matched it with another $10,000. And then another 26 people, me included, put more money in, not $10,000. So we are at $26,000 in counting, and we haven't seen all the money come in yet. I went to that party for Building Hope. Uh, that's why Tim Casey had to leave the discussion earlier. I know he'll be here at uh, some work session or council meeting to give you his thoughts as well relative to short-term rentals. Um, but I wanted to present you with this thank you card and the bubble letters are mine. I'm thinking over thinking of going to the preschool and teaching kids how to print. Oh, I like it. It's good. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Better than Jeffrey can do. Draw that with your feet. You know, just to sort of echo John, for those of you that didn't go, there was a lot of talk about the fact that Todd committed suicide, took his own life, which, you know, we've been to these things before where that's happened. It's really been sort of an undercurrent. Man, it was out in the open from the time his sister spoke first and she right away and everybody that came after talked about that. So it was great. Yeah, which was great. And I was so proud of the youth <clears throat> that was there, you know, his friends that were from Breckenridge grew up with him and how hard they worked to support him yeah. and, and keep him going. It's not that young anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> they are to me. <laughs> they may be 40 or late 30s or 40 or something, but I mean, it was it was really heartwarming. It was, yeah, it was a great event. What a great way to celebrate his life. Though. All right. Uh, anyone else in the public wish to comment tonight? Thank you. Public hearing is closed. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank uh, we have a uh, Breckenridge Creative Arts update via. She's coming over. Via z z Zoom. I knew there was other language to use. But there she is. Sorry. You can speak now. Oh, no, it's still the other one. Oh. Yeah, it's still the other one.
<laughs> First thing I did was look for a check and there was nothing. <laughs> My kid does. Can you unmute and speak? Okay, she looks muted. Uh, Eric, well, I could I could give a go for a quick update. I can do it later under. Uh, well, we got yeah, we'll do it under committee reports. So, okay. Um, yeah, Peyton says she's asked her to unmute. If she hasn't responded. Okay, okay we're going to move along then. Um, uh -huh. We start with continued business. Second reading of council bills. <sighs> Uh, Council Bill Number Twenty Three, Series Twenty Twenty One. This is an ordinance amending Section Four Four Two, the Breckenridge Town Code, concerning the authority of the Liquor and Marijuana Licensing Authority to accept a fine in lieu of suspension. The current ordinance uh, allows the Liquor and Marijuana Licensing Authority not only to suspend or revoke a license in the case of a violation, also allows the violating licensee to ask for permission to pay a fine in lieu of actually serving the suspension. Serving the suspension means they cannot, they're not able to sell liquor during the period of the suspension. Um, the, this ordinance increases the minimum and maximum amount of the fine that the Liquor and Marijuana Licensing Authority can accept it would, if the ordinance is approved, the minimum would be 500, the max would be 100,000. It's reflective uh, of a um, statutory amendment that recently was enacted by the legislature. There are no changes in first reading. All right, questions for Tom. <clears throat> Any in the audience wish to comment on this second reading? <clears throat> Public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? Well, on second reading, we'll be passed Council Bill Number 23, Series 2021, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Jello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owen. <clears throat> Ms. Sade. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have an emergency ordinance this evening. This is an a an ordinance amending chapter one, and it's, uh, I'm sorry, council bill number 25. An ordinance amending chapter one of title eight of the Breckenridge Town Code by amending the International Residential Code 2018, the International Energy Conservation Code 2018, extending indefinitely the deadline for full compliance with the training exercise program with respect to the United States Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home National Program declaring an emergency and providing for an immediate effective date of this ordinance. Mark. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, good evening. Um, this ordinance in front of you will, as Eric stated, um, extend the training period for the Zero Energy Ready Homes program. It's one of our programs intended to implement our sustainability goals and the climate action goals the climate action plan that we adopted several years ago. Um, we will, um, we, we had a trial training period back from July through December of last year, and then compliance became required at the start of this year. It takes a uh, ho typical home 12, 18 months to go through the process of construction. We've ran into some issues with the contractors. We're trying to be sensitive to those. We think there's some legitimate issues that need to be further addressed, and we want to work those issues through. And so we have recommended extending the training period until such time that we have addressed those issues appropriately. Um, that's all I have. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Mark. Any questions for Mark or staff? You're bringing everyone into the loop, the HC3, the, the contractors, the developers, the yeah. Basement. Absolutely, Jeffrey. We'll um, do some type of outreach to let all the contractors know about this. And HC3, we've already talked to. Okay. All right. Anyone in the public wish to comment on this emergency ordinance? 
Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? I move we pass Council Bill Number Twenty Five, Emergency Ordinance, uh, Twenty Twenty One, the title of which has been read into the record. Second. Motion and second. Is there any further council discussion? Roll call. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Jello. Yes. Ms. Owen. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have a first reading of Council Bill Number 24, Series 2021, an ordinance amending sections 5 8 8 of the Breckenridge Town Code concerning noise in public spaces. Tim. Uh, this ordinance would amend the current town ordinance dealing with noise in, the, in public spaces. The current ordinance essentially says that it's unlawful for a person to play a radio or a stereo or something that reproduces music in two, if two conditions are met. One is it has to be plainly audible, and secondly, it has to disturb the peace, quiet, and comfort of neighbors and passerbys passers by. Um, the proposed ordinance would change the standard to simply make it unlawful to produce music through, uh, for example, an amplifier, if it's plainly audible at a distance of 25 feet. That takes away the uh, subjectivity of the disturbing the peace and quiet component. It does not require a third party witness a violation could be determined solely by the officer in the field. It also, uh, this ordinance also adds a definition of the term plainly audible. Excellent, thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim? Anyone in the audience wish to comment on this first reading this evening? Public hearing is closed, motion. On first reading, and will we pass Council Bill number 24, series 2021, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion by council? Roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Sade. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have three resolutions this evening. The first is resolution number 19, series 2021. A resolution approving a development management agreement with Gorman and Company, LLC, a Wisconsin limited liability company, for McCain Workforce Housing, Lori. Uh, yes, for the record, uh, Lori Best with the Community Development Department. And this resolution um, would authorize um, the town manager to sign a um, development management agreement um, with Gorman and Company um, in regard to the development of the Alta Verde Phase Two project. Um, the development agreement, um, development management agreement outlines um, the anticipated number of units um, and the uh, responsibilities of each of the entities. Um, the project will include rent capped units. It will include some income capped units. Um, the deed restriction will survive foreclosure. The town will loan approximately $6 million and then up to 2 million additional if needed for net zero. Um, and we'll cover tap fees and provide permit fee waivers. Um, remove some asphalt piles and ensure the site's out of the floodplain. Um, town will provide utilities and road to the site um, and provide a 75 renew year renewable lease um, to Gorman. And they will be responsible for constructing and managing the apartments and complying with the terms of the deed restrictions that set the income caps and the rental caps. And we will make a change to the development management agreement that was included in your packet. Um, <coughs> to revise that um, section D, which indicated that it was uh, primarily 120% AMI um, rent and uh, revise that to be accurate. And it's basically 80% rents and some 120% rents. So we can re revise that language before we have it signed. Thank you, Lori. Uh, questions for Lori? Everybody's gonna be good with that when we get to it next. Um, anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution? for the McCain property. No. Nope. Motion, Jeffrey? I make a resolution that we pass uh, resolution number 19, series 2021, <laughs> a resolution approving development management agreement uh, with Gorman and Company LLC, a Wisconsin limited liability company, McCain Workforce Housing, and we're looking for someone to second my resolution. I second the resolution for the resolution. Well, there's a resoluted motion and she a did second. That quite resolved. Good. <laughs> uh, any more discussion? 
Oh, roll call, please. Helen? Mr. Carlton? Yes. Ms. Ellis? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Ms. Giello? Yes. Ms. Sade? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. Uh, we have resolution number 20, series 2021. This is a resolution making miscellaneous amendments to the town council procedures and rules of order concerning virtual meetings of the council. Tim? Resolution, as indicated, would amend the council rules dealing with when and under what conditions virtual attendance is permitted in a town council meeting. This is the same document that was handed out to the council two weeks ago. Uh, the change needs to be made by resolution and that's why this document is in front of you. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim about this resolution? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution? Well, uh, well what's it called? Can I have a motion? motion. Jeez. Yeah. I make a motion to pass resolution number 20 series 2021, a resolution um, making miscellaneous amendments to the town council procedures and rules of order concerning virtual meetings of the council. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mayor, Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. We have a uh, resolution number 21, series 2021, a resolution approving the employment of Porzak Law LLC as special counsel. Mayor and counsel, the town charter allows uh, the council to appoint special counsel as needed. Uh, to assist the town attorney for years, we have utilized Glenn Porzak as our water attorney. Uh, his last firm was dissolved and he has since started a, a new law firm, Porzak Law LLC. So, but this resolution would allow uh, me to enter into an engagement letter to continue his services to serve as our water attorney. Thank you, Rick. Any questions of Rick? No. Anyone wish to comment about this in the public on the hiring of Porzak Law LLC? And none public hearing is closed as their motion. I move we pass resolution number 21, series 2021, a resolution approving the employment of Porzak, Porzak, Porzak Law LLC as special counsel. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further council discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. That was less than six minutes. No billing for that. <laughs> planning matters. Planning to commission decisions. Is there a comment up this evening? No. Planning commission decisions stand as presented. Uh, I will make one note that we've heard that uh, ex-planning commissioner Jim Lamb has passed away of stomach cancer. What? Yeah. Oh. He had stomach cancer. He was in California. I think a bunch of us have heard from different yeah. people that he passed. So, oh. yeah, he was a good. He, and he was on council for a while too. He was a good, yeah. good public, public citizen. So, um, all right. The report of the town manager and staff. Rick, what you got? Anything? Um, Nothing. No, just a meeting which we already talked about. I have a couple. Dick and I have a few things we want to make sure we go over in the BCA update. But. Okay. And we're not doing a. Is Tamara still waiting to talk or no? She's available to talk if we still have time in the. You want to bring her over for a couple of minutes? Quick update? Sure. Sure. <clears throat> Got it worked out. Hello. Tamara, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, you got a couple of minutes to do an update here. Can you hear me and see me? Can't see you, but we can hear you. Is... Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Mamula and Town Council. I'm uh, Tamara Nudzachi Park for the record. Uh, just a couple of quick updates for you. First of all, I apologize for the technical difficulties. My computer froze right at the most inopportune time. Um, but I, I do have several updates. Uh, first, I, I wanted to let the, the council and mayor know that I was pleased to accept the BCA board's offer to assume the 
the permanent position of president and CEO of Breckenridge Creative Arts today. Um, and it's an honor to serve the community in creating safe and vibrant arts district in Breckenridge. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, the BCA team anticipates the need for a venue-specific COVID-19 policy in advance uh, of or in addition to any official public health order. Um, and our philosophy at BCA uh, is a belief that in order to continue to operate, the organization must take action to protect public health and safety. And the ecosystem of live music and art education could be severely damaged by another shout uh, shut down. So moreover, we feel a responsibility to the smooth operation of our business and to the community to lead in the area of policy making. Um, so last, yesterday, I guess it was, the BCA board endorsed a proof of vaccination policy to be implemented in BCA managed cultural facilities owned by the town with the support of our resident company users and representatives. The board has asked uh, our team to advance the timeline for implementation. Uh, our venue and guest services team is putting the finishing touches on a timeline and plan in coordination with our partners. Uh, one of our most uh, pressing issues in, in advancing that plan is really identifying, engaging, and orienting the appropriate security and venue staffing to um, manage such, such a policy. And we have seen some uh, shortages in that area, clearly in the community um, and specifically with security companies across the state. Um, so that said, we really appreciate uh, the thoughtful process uh, that was reviewed in the work session earlier this evening and the data-driven decision-making on short-term re rentals to support the development of our workforce so that we can provide a safe and quality guest experience um, in our arts venues in the town. Um, so that is, is our direction and we will keep you informed. Uh, our hope is to, to advance this proof of vaccination policy and roll it out during the month of September in coordination with our partners and please stay tuned for more information. Uh, we have also received our PPP, uh, Employer Tax uh, Credit, and the Shuttered Venue Operators Government Funds. And we are in the process of putting together uh, the puzzle of qualified expenses for each initiative. Um, that is a work in process in terms of the forgiveness of the PPP loan in particular, but we do anticipate a return of $170,000 to the town um, prior to or during the fourth quarter. Um, so we've also been working on, and I want to thank Kelly and Dick and Rick for, uh, for really articulating the town's objectives and helping us develop a draft budget, um, which our voting board approved last week um, for a recommendation to the town council. I'm very much looking forward to going over the key initiatives um, in that recommended budget, um, which does include a full program program integration and um, fundraising integration for the organization. Uh, it also has a, a pretty remarkable uh, program that we're called calling Precious Plastics. And I want to thank Rick and Kelly for their letters of support for our outside funding of that initiative matched by the town's um, investment potentially in our FY22 proposal. Precious Plastics, we would set up up uh, collection sites for all of those recyclables that are not currently being collected at sites across the county um, in plastic area. So number, number fours, fives, and sixes in particular, and we would essentially grind them up, melt them down, and turn them into material for our community to use in their art projects and design projects, as well as um, more spectacular, innovative uh, installations that would be used on the creative district. So uh, we look forward to talking to you more about uh, that Precious Plastics initiative, as well as all the other components of the PROSE budget that we'll submit later this month. Excellent. Yeah, we need that. 
Any All questions? Right. When would that preci uh, precious plastic program in a perfect world uh, begin? <laughs> In a perfect world, which um, we hope to have, uh, and you know, as it continues to evolve, uh, we applied to the National Endowment of the Arts for that matching funding to launch the initiative. We're going to start the planning October 1st with a goal of rolling it out uh, in July of 2022. And it would be uh, at least a two-year project. And if it's a huge success and hit, um, then we will uh, obviously extend that in, well into the future. Cool. All right. Any other questions? I just wanted to say Gibson Heights and uh, Vista Point, we had our first air stage block party. It was the first one I was able to go to. And they were so much fun. And we heard from so many members of the community that it really felt like a mini town party. Um, we had a couple poachers from other neighborhoods, um, oh, but it was nice. such a good time. So thank you for putting those on. <laughs> what was that band again? Dragon something? I cannot remember the name. Dragon Deer. Dragon Deer. Dragon Deer. Yeah. Yeah. Out of the front range, they're a good psychedelic uh, blues funk band. So I'm glad to hear it was a good success. And um, we have a couple more air stage uh, events, including Brecktoberfest, as well as the Wine Classic and possibly another neighborhood concert in Blue River in September. And then we're going to send it back to Portland for some repairs and a little storage time and hopefully uh, bring that back in 2022. Ooh, excellent. Well, thank you for the update. <clears throat> Thank you. And again, apologize for the initial difficulties, but it's great to be here. Have a great night. Thank you. you too. All right. Thank you. Uh, report of the mayor and council members. We have cast this. <clears throat> we have cast this, this week, Thursday, Friday. Oh, 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 yeah. I'm thinking of the MMC. Oh, no, we haven't <laughs> had MMC. No, we have cast, and we're going to talk a lot about housing. Yeah. Carol, sure. Dick, and I are going. So we'll bring back some uh, things, find out what's going on. Uh, open space, anything to add? Oh boy, uh, we had a site visit and a meeting yesterday. <clears throat> a lot happened, we did talk about a lot. Um, so the Friends of the Breckenridge Trails end of season party, I believe we all have invites now. It's on September 23rd at Carter Park. Um, Forest Health projects are taking shape for this year and next with a seasonal stop from October 31st to about June 30th. The Swan River, we talked about the Swan River Reach B construction. It will cost an additional $150,000 in 2021. So look forward to that. Uh, the Quandary Peak pilot study ends on October 31st. So far, so good with the parking and the shuttling. Um, the Summit Public Radio and TV will construct the first segment of the power line from Lorium Trailhead to Iowa Mill as approved in 2018. Per the agreement, they will have to restore the road to the town of Breckenridge County standards in that agreement. Um, SPRTV is regrouping to plan the second and final segment of the power line. So that we talked a little bit about that before. Um, the landowners have closed the Illinois Creek Trail um, that was formerly the al Katami property. Um, they closed it over disputes with the county planning process. So that's also a discussion that's going on right now. Where's spicy. that again? That's, that's at the Illinois Creek Trail. So they closed the portion. They, they added closed. fencing. In Spruce Valley? So you can't get no, to the Breckenridge that's in Trail Indiana. now? Illinois. Scott, will you? It's the Autonomy family, but their lot was going to be the town property and Robert Gibble. And so a little, can you little still mountain. Get to it going around Little Mountain. See, and you still make the connection, or? Wait a minute. So you can't get from from uh, the the ice rink to Wakefield. But I believe. Oh. But isn't did did we talk about how there was a planned workaround, but that's not in use yet? Uh huh. Those are, uh, we thought we were with the county, county process. We believe that we had a local came in and 
never had to use this test route, it's also a property with good integration. So that is happening. Um, we did do a site visit to the Little Mountain Trail. Um, that's in the that um, open space has been working on. Um, it's beautiful. I really like it. I they um, Tony told us like all the things that need to happen, but it's really it's it's right off the Troll Trail, and I think it'll be a really great use for um, for people. It's a quick like a mile and a quarter hike and there's a different it's it's a bit of a circle um can you get to it from the from the troll yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's not open now it's not open now oh. don't use it now jeffrey mm -hmm. but it is a nice it's it's a little it's a little steeper than like a beginner trail but it's um i think it'll serve people well so it's for next summer is that what you're saying when they complete it and that's like <laughs> Hiking only, right? It's hiking. Yes, it's right. Yes, it's hiking only. Um, but there, but the trails team did a, a beautiful job with it. We had an update from Bill Campy from DTJ. Um, they're doing a lot of surveys. They have a lot of things in the works. Um, the next phase of public engagement will come with a project website around September first. More and more community engagement. Um, they will be presenting to council once a month. No, wait, once a month or once a quarter? Once a month, once a month. And they will be also presenting to InfoSec. Uh, so, and then we also had a presentation from our own Mark Truckee about the McCain open space and um, the possibility of buying, selling, trading 15 acres from the town. Hey, so just in case someone in, that was watching on Zoom couldn't hear what Scott was saying. Oh yeah. That that trail, uh, the the access is being worked on with the county with kind of negotiating with the family that blocked off the trail from the ice rink to, uh, to Wakefield. Yes, okay. that is correct. All right. Any yeah. other questions I can try to answer? <laughs> this is very... We got a lot done, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, tourism or heritage, Mr. Coon? Let's start out with Breckenridge Heritage Alliance. Uh, Larissa is exploring a couple of different federal funding opportunities by the American Rescue Plan for the Milne Park Project, uh, which could significantly reduce the BHA's request via the town uh, capital process. This is a priority for Larissa right now, and we should have more information or answers in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, break, the BTO, uh, their, their board meeting is this week. So I'll update you further next time. All right, thank uh, you. Yeah, I'll just let you know that I spoke with uh, Jerry Dizik on the, who's the chair or the president of the board for that. And, and you know, I expressed my feelings that uh, that capital project, the Milne capital project would probably get a lot more traction with the council if they were to bring a good additional funding source forward uh, in one of these grant opportunities. So that's what they're pursuing. Great. Yeah. Great. Good. Excellent. Uh, creative arts, anything to add? Yeah, I do. Um, in the budget process, they requested um, funding in our capital fund for 2022 for a new projector uh, for the Riverwalk Center. And that's about $125,000. Unfortunately, just recently that thing kind of died and uh, they they have gone ahead and, and purchased a new projector. Well, they're in the process of doing that. They're in the process of purchasing a new projector. And, uh, Rick and I talked and, and felt like instead of asking council to um, consider it in the CIP discussion for 2022, it's it's going to be spent in 2021. So we wanted to present to you if you're willing to do an appropriation for $125,000 for a new projector for the Riverwalk Center. How's everybody feel? It is no good without a projector. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, are you guys all okay with the uh, uh, proof of vaccine for the all the venues? Yeah. They say what they what are they going to accept? 
Well, they're still working out all those details. But it'll be so the, the standard, you know, ID and uh, the your My Colorado app. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'll work. work I would assume they're going to. That's that. the trend we're seeing in yeah, all these things. Now. Yeah. I mean, it's what really you, it's it's more and more common. Yeah. Rick, what did you say? I have the card. What did you say about your phone? The My My Colorado, Colorado app. app. Are you oh. could you just show your card? Yeah, but that's and kind of old here's school. Here's the problem: is the cards are easy to. Forge and they validated the My Colorado. So the app comes from you put your driver's license number in and it scans your face and then puts your vaccine card that's been uploaded through Summit County. Okay. It's actually really cool. It has your so you have your driver's license. You can put your your insurance in there. Yeah. My Registration. Colorado. Yeah, My Colorado. Yeah. Very cool. Free. And it's free. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey likes free. Yeah. If you didn't know that. That right here. Uh, events. Carol. We have not had a meeting, but we do have one item for council discussion. Shannon sent us some information on the um, Breck Film Fast Fest decal request. Um, so they are applying for sidewalk decals again. Um, in 2020, we approved them. Um, I was not yet on council, but it sounds like we approved them really in a special situation because of COVID. Um, and it was intended to be a one-time permit because of the challenges with COVID. Um, so for 2021, they applied again. Very similar to last year, the dates they're looking for are September 3rd to September 20th. There'll be eight total decals around the Blue River Plaza and town sidewalks throughout Main Street. And uh, Shannon would have liked to take it to BEC or the SEPA group, but it was just a tight turnaround. So she wanted our input. And I'm sure if we have specific questions, Gary can help us. With answers. <laughs> Here's the deal. The, you know, we approved it as a one year thing. I think it worked well for them. They'd like to do it again this year as part of their film festival. We, you know, we try to control so not everybody's sticking things out all over the place. So we do a pretty good job of it. Is it a big deal for you guys or not? <laughs> do you want to see the I'm fine with it. I, I prefer not because I'm afraid we do it for one, we do it for all, and we're going to have yeah. decals all over the place. Uh, we know these guys will be responsible and take them off. We've had some bad experiences with yeah. decals in the past, so I would say no. Dennis? Yeah, I prefer not. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. Oh, the tiebreaker. What did you oh, say? No, no, no. She said yes. Oh. But I do have a, a request that they would just go through the appropriate channels next year and not do yeah. this emergency oops last minute thing again. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, I would actually say, <laughs> um, I would say yes, but I would not like to see this again. Yeah. One, one, year, one more year is fine. Yeah. But I mean, not next year. Right. That's why so we I'm sort of left yes the emergency that. ordinance in. So. Yeah, this year, no more. This year only from me. Yeah. I'm good with that. You're on double secret probation. I'm yeah. Okay if you ask again, but I'm not going to be here. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Child care. Kelly? I don't think we have an update besides what was in the packet. Workforce housing. You want to add on? <laughs> oh, I think we got a lot done today. So. Uh -huh. And social so, equity. A lot. The three musketeers. Oh, we have. <laughs> We have a meet and greet on September. We have a meet and greet on September eighth at eight thirty. Um, has the location been nailed down at all? Yeah, it's uh the Crown, in the rear pat patio. Okay. Yeah. So I'd, yeah. Great. Day morning. Eight thirty a.m. Yep. at the Crown on get, September eighth. Uh, yes. Calendar invites. Oh, yeah. to meet and greet. Yeah. When is it? Oh. With the social equity fund. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, I'm already going. When is it again? What number? September eighth oh, at eight thirty at the Crown. You're probably not around, Jeffrey. Yeah, well, if I will be too busy. All right. Anything else? Uh, other matters. Yeah, I have one. Uh, yeah. I want to do it for you so James can go home. Um, uh, I've had some from Airport Auto. Uh, our signage is kind of weird for the airport parking, especially with the Condi shuttle. Shuttle. Um, if if you go on the map, you, they tell you to take a right at that road, whatever that is. And then there's like a big bus icon on the map, which is where Airport Auto's parking is. And they just, so people are making laps around Airport Auto and it's a it's a, like a residential area as well as a business. So anyway, I talked to James and what we need is we could take that turn. We need a, just a sign that says parking straight ahead. 
just to, to kind of make it a little bit more clear. So um, I told them I'd bring it up on this uh, meeting. Well, since that's what's happening, Jeff, cool. the next step is going to go to SBA and also go through this uh, auto. And oh, good. Okay. Because they just. Perfect. They just replaced my fluids. And I'm going to have them work on my cars after that. So. Oh, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> Thank you, James. Oh. Any other matters? Yeah. Um, Dick. I had a local bike shop reach out to me and express some frustration that, uh, the, according to them, there's two bike shops renting the type two, type B, I forget what we call them, electric bikes, the fast ones. And, um, you know, they found, they just found it frustrating that people are coming to them and going, we don't want these slow ones. We got passed by these fast ones oh, Jesus. on the bike path. And, and uh, don't you have fast ones? We're going to these other shops. And, Do we know the shops names? Um, it, it, the, the, uh, they were uh, Chronology and um, is it Breeze, the one in Park Avenue Lofts? Oh, that, I think that's Breeze. Oh, yeah. For me, yeah, we should do a sting. Yeah, I'll go on the cover. Go a bike. I'll go on the cover with a floppy hat and jeans. They were pretty frustrated, and his the, their concern was that if we go confront these guys, they're just gonna say, "Well, we tell them not to ride on the bike path," but I'm not sure that's true. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, if we could talk to those guys, that would be great. Um, and then also had another. I talked to Rick about this, but I I, I was asked to ask about it again. If you're walking from La Cima up those stairs, what's that parking lot again? Tonopon. Right next to Breckel. Yeah. So you're basically walking from La Cima to Tonopah. During the day, when you're crossing French Street right there, it's right at that turn and it's super dangerous. And, you know, these are some of the neighbors in that area. And um, they, they've just watched a lot of close calls there okay. and concern. And they were hoping we could stripe a a crosswalk there and i i don't know if that's gone anywhere well you know, we, we talked talk about, about james that. yeah we're looking at that so that's where my own community is at is evaluating that right now okay but great some of the same concerns that you've expressed now are coming from the same community that um striking a crosswalk yeah oh yeah, the problem is though we've we've got a public walkway that goes right to the lot. I mean, we can't, if we stop it on French Street, it's a it's a pathway that goes nowhere. So, gotcha. Right on that turn. Yes. Yeah. Whatever you can do to make it safer yeah. is, I think, what these folks would like. That's yeah, fair enough. So, thank you, James. Awesome. Thanks. Anything else? Nothing. Anyone? Anything else for the good of the order this evening? Nice job then I cancel. Oh, We're out. I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> See, if anybody's got it in them. Hey, uh, Dick's inviting us.